Good. Yeah. Okay. So the mic is working too. Mm -hmm. Cool. So then maybe start video. Beautiful. And then open up the chat. There we go. Cool. And I feel like it's better this way, so you could actually uh, maybe hit the view and do. Oh, there you go, full screen. There you go. Cool. Oh, but then you got to pull the chat up again. So it's pulling. There you go. I like something with like that, so the presenter can see the question. It seems like it's easier. I think that worked better, right? Yeah. And then, so he'll join and share his screen. I'll join and be able to share my screen when I need to. When you need, when I have time. Like at the half time. Then exactly. you can just take it back. Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right. Not bad, right? Yeah, that's actually pretty. Yeah, <laughs> and trust me, we learned the hard way. Right? There was days where I'll be here for like an hour at a time trying to figure this out. Well, I'm glad we have it kind of streamlined now. Well, that's what a year will do, you know. I mean, well, for most people, not everybody learns. Oh, come back real quick. Thanks for mine. Uh, you can connect, but I want to show you one other thing. Oh, come here. Oh, sorry, yeah, I should come back. Speak to a thousand times. So just in terms of the room, um, if you want to, you see how the camera does a lot of roof or seating showing? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily right, so just yep, yeah, click camera. And just push it down. Pretty freaking easy, right? Yeah. Right, I like that better. Yeah, I usually do that. It's just you know, so you're in a hurry, you forget, but I try to do that. Okay. You can pull forward. Does Tuner do anything? I'm sorry? Tuner? Uh, not that I know. Settings. Yeah. Awesome. Then I'll, I'll just hop in. And Sounds good. Start it up. So well, I will leave this here in case you need to respond. Yes, you can them, but I don't think I can take whatever works for you. Okay. You good? You need anything else? Uh, that's pretty much it. All right. Come on. Okay. Prop open that last door. Yeah, seems good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You already know if you need anything, you know where to find me. Um, if, you are, if you think you're not going to finish the quad card thing, let me know. Okay. And then I'll jump on it. I am leaving at four today. Okay, so I'll try to come by before it's over, but um, it's over at four anyway. Okay, so I just have to like close up the room and just make sure you are going to close it off. And... Yeah, once Anthony comes in, I will. Oh, when you leave, you mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah, when you leave, just hit the power. Okay. Like, so it turns off and just close the doors. Okay, cool. And the yeah. lights are the lights automatic? Or... Yeah, the lights are automatic. So what I usually do is once the presenter comes in, I close that front door because it's annoying when people come in the front door during the presentation. Yeah. And I just leave a back door open so everybody comes to the back. So lights. Think about it as a dimmer, but instead of having a switch, it's a little button. Buttons. So the one is the brightest, six or whatever is the lowest. Okay. So I usually do like a little bit darker front and wider in the back. <laughs> that's just teacher experience. So on the back, I have it on one, up here, I have it on three. And that's just something I learned from teaching. Okay. I think I told you to be a teacher, yeah? Um, I think you mentioned that, yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, markers, all that stuff are here. Usually they don't write on it, but some do. Oh, we got something right here. That's me. Oh. <laughs> that doesn't look like you. Look, uh, it's uh, me in high school. I'm in desperate need of a new headshot, for sure. What's your ethnic background, by the way? Uh, I'm Indonesian and white. Uh, 
You look a lot more Asian in that picture. Do I? Yeah. No. Yeah, I need a new one though. That one is four years old at this point. So let's take off the sound though when people get in there. Okay. Do you know how to do that? Uh, okay. No, I'm sure. okay. I think you might have to do it on this one because whatever logs in first is the host. So, um, oh. Over here, the little arrow. The what? The little arrow next to me. Are you saying this? Yeah. If we're not whatever you're working on, then I'll, uh, I'll figure it out. I just can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Okay. And so it says select manage participants from the toolbar and bottom. Maybe more. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. oh, there you go. There we go. So, all right. All right, man, you know where to find me if you need anything? Yep. Good stuff, man. Good first step. Did I get learning something? Yep. Cool. No, first day tends to be rocky, but you know, or not rocky. No, but I mean, I, I can probably just come in and do this other than that one. So this is right. Yeah. And that's kind of the idea. So you could put it as you know, you ran a seminar series for an entire semester because it was the first one of the semester. Awesome. Yeah. I, I already put that on my resume. Beautiful. All right, man. Uh, yeah, again, if you need anything, let me know about the QR code. Um, if I'm going to do that right now. Yeah, email it to me so I can print it. Okay. Or do you want to get added to that printer? Um, let's do that later. Okay. I'll, I'll let you do it for now.
Yeah. yeah. Oh. You're a little bit early, but yeah. <laughs> this is your first time? Yeah. I'm Chris. I'm um I like coordinate the zoo. Okay. So our speaker's gonna get here sometime in the next five, ten minutes. Okay. So just store wherever you want. Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> Hey Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Came in right when I left. <laughs> nice to see you again. Thank you, you too. Being here. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm excited. All right. Hopefully so I can deliver. Yeah, it's pretty much the same as last time. Just share your screen. Yeah. Uh, you'll join, and then. Um, so I join the meeting, and then just share your screen up here, and then everybody else will see it, and then we'll all see it. And then so you, everyone in here will just be watching the Zoom meeting, basically. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So we don't even need to plug in anywhere. All right. That's it. Yeah, yes. and then um, just during the halftime, I'm going to take over, like, when you give a break. I'm going to okay. update real quick and give a quick announcement on some current um, happenings. Okay. Do events and all that. Great. And I have the updated one. The updated slides. The slides. Yeah. I think you can send it to you with the QR codes. Yes. Cool. Can I get you anything? You want me to grab the water? Oh, water would be fantastic. Yeah, thank Maybe you. One second. Appreciate that. Mm. I'll be right back. Sure. Someone's bringing a bottle right now. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. You got a piece of mics here, so yeah. The Did you do anything else special with that? No, actually, let me, let me test real quick. Okay. Okay. All good. All good. All right. <clears throat>
Oh, and then um, your preference for questions. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to call them out as they come up, or do you want to wait until the end and then answer them all? Um, it's pretty long. Yeah, if there's a, like a relevant question to what I'm talking about, maybe let's do it as I'm talking. Okay. Because otherwise, people might get lost. And if it's not relevant, I'll just save it to that. We can save it to the end. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah. How's it going? Fine. Did you get the link? Um, I don't know if I did. Hey, I how's it going? Good. How about yourself? I'm good. I did send you the link. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. I probably have it. I, I sent you the link and the uh, updated um, slide deck with the. I got the slide deck. So that's in the same. It was in the same email. Yeah. And then Chris will be here. He's officially my student working out. So awesome. He's going to be doing a good chunk of uh, the heavy lifting. Do I do LMU guest? <laughs> Doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. Well, much appreciated. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Just register the guest on this list. This Paul Church thing is not working properly. I'm trying to see if I can figure it out, but it might be good. Okay. So you're just in the channel. Make your search in there. Just general welcome to my name. Okay. You in? About to be. Cool. I mean, you're in. Yeah. I said that time. All right. That's great. Uh, if you need anything, I'll let Chris know. Okay. Right across the hall. So, yeah. you know, thanks again. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, totally. Yeah. One second while I log in everything here.
significant progress. progress. I mean, yeah. just make sure I speak your laptop on that song. There we go. <laughs> Echo. And then you have the video up here already, right? So I mean, that's. I am going to do that right there. Oh, you can share your screen. Right yeah, I'll just do a screen share. Let's see. Sure that, that works. Hey, the clicker works too. All set. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Anthony Walker, and um, I am a alum of the business school here at LMU. I got my MBA graduating in 2012. I was here from 2008 through 2012. So I was in business school at a very interesting time in the country's economic history, which is also when I got interested in investing in real estate. Right here, I took a real estate investing class and I thought I would do that and have a career change. I was working in insurance at the time in a corporate job, which was no fun. And um, so the school is basically totally responsible for me changing my career. And now 10, 11 years later, here we are, much better off for it. Um, <clears throat> I am also the uh, chair of student relations with the LMU Real Estate Advisory Council. So uh, we are a group of alumni, mostly, who some parents as well, who want to uh, elevate the level of real estate coursework and experience and mentorship opportunities and stuff for the students here at the school, uh, because we want to be able to hire LMU students for all of our companies. And, you know, we were kind of behind the curve on that uh, compared to some of the other schools in town. So we all got together about eight or nine years ago and created this council. Um, and so part of what we've done is creating this real estate certificate program, uh, which we're excited to deliver for the second year in a row now this year. Uh, so glad that you were able to make it. And uh, hopefully you understand the criteria, the qualifications, you got to take a certain number of seminars, uh, one of the, I think you have to take one of the core courses and uh, then you can get your certificate if you go through it all. Today's class is basically the fundamentals class of the real estate certificate program. Uh, so this is real estate investment principles. This is what you need to kind of set the foundation for everything that you're going to learn um, in all of the other seminars and definitely what you're going to use in much more detail. Um, if you're going to take Dr. San's class or uh, Professor Vecito's class as well. All the terminology that we'll talk about today, if you're thinking about taking those classes, or if you already are, is going to be um, relatable to what they're doing. And this is what we use as uh, investment real estate professionals every day. So uh, hopefully it's useful for you, whether you're online or in person. Obviously, questions are great as we go along. It's going to be pretty dense, pretty fast. It's three hours long. Uh, we will take a break in the middle, and um, I don't expect you to absorb everything you hear today because it's really a lot to, to take in, but it will kind of introduce you to some of the terminology, the metrics, the math, the strategy, how to think about investing in real estate um, at a very high level, and maybe direct your interest in, in a variety of different directions uh, and take your, your studies from there. So um, without further ado, here we go. So this is me. <laughs> I had shot from like eight years ago, so I apologize. But um, I came from Minneapolis originally. I moved out to LA in 2000 to go to undergrad. Um, I went to USC for undergrad. Uh, went to business school here, like I mentioned, and uh, graduated in 2012. While I was here, I met a company called Buckingham Investments through the another student that I uh, knew here at school. And I was really interested at the time in getting into real estate investing. I didn't really know where to start. And the company was all about teaching people how to invest in real estate that maybe had never done it before or didn't have a lot of experience and combining that with the brokerage model, which is 
being an agent or a broker and selling properties for commissions. So that was really interesting to me. I started as a client of the company while I still had my corporate job. I bought a little duplex for myself and um, I've grown a portfolio since then. This is out of date. I have 22 properties now in the LA area. And so I've slowly expanded my portfolio over the last uh, 12, 13 years. I started buying something like 2009, 2010. And uh, I do mostly apartment buildings and right here locally. So uh, a lot of the stuff I have is in Long Beach. Uh, I have one building in Inglewood, a couple of buildings in Torrance as well. So right here in our local area. Um, and that's been really fun getting to know the market and being a participant and learning how it all works. Uh, it definitely works really well. You can scale up a sizable port portfolio of real estate here if you, if you know what you're doing. So that's a little bit about me. I use my expertise as an investor to help clients buy properties and sell properties and grow their portfolios just like what I did. So that's my job. My day job is being a broker in that capacity in which I basically buy and sell properties. So I'm like a real estate agent or broker that would help you sell a house, except I do apartment buildings mostly, although some office, retail, development stuff, the occasional house here and there for my family, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, I make money from commissions. So just like anybody else that would help you uh, buy or sell a house, same kind of job, It's that the buildings tend to be larger, more expensive. And by virtue of working in that part of the industry, I understand the way that the numbers fit together in that property type really well, which has allowed me to build my portfolio like that. So uh, I'll use my experience uh, as well as, you know, kind of what I've learned along the way. And we're going to talk about a lot of kind of foundational topics here in investment real estate. Let me uh, move. See. That's not my screen. Oh, yeah. I can do that. So uh, super high level stuff. Why real estate to begin with? Uh, it has some major advantages. So first and foremost, this is probably my favorite. It's a hard asset, right? If you buy a building, it's yours. You have the dirt, you have the structure, you can do what you want with it. You can use it to generate income. You can change it, you can upgrade it, you can sell it. You have control, it's totally yours. Very different from buying one share in a company, right? That you might not have very much control over on a stock market or something like that. Now, real estate can be fractionalized like that through syndicated deals or REITs or stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you, those entities still own a hard asset. So that's a huge advantage when you're looking at real estate versus other types of investment options or what we would call asset classes. Um, like I mentioned, you have direct control over the asset too, right? So unless you own a company yourself and you're calling the shots at your company, you have very little control if you own shares in a company, especially if you're not the majority owner. When you have a piece of real estate, you decide whatever you want to do with it. And there's huge benefits that that yields to you as an investor. Pretty easy to do due diligence. So just like you would do if you're looking at buying a company, uh, you're inspecting everything about your purchase when you do due diligence. We'll talk about that in more detail later. But it's really easy to figure out kind of what you have with a piece of property, especially like with an apartment building. There's not a lot of mystery to that. Physical building is there. You can hire professionals to inspect it and tell you what sort of condition it's in. The leases are pretty straightforward. These are just regular old, you know, residential leases for the most part. If you've ever leased an apartment, you kind of understand that already. Very easy to kind of check your assumptions, figure out what it's going to cost you to own a piece of property. Um, you know, look at utility bills, historical repairs, what property taxes are going to be. There's not a lot of uncertainty as to how a property is going to perform. You can't predict everything, but it's way easier to predict how, say, an apartment building might perform than buying a tech company or something like that, right? So people love real estate for that reason, because it's really predictable, it's really easy, it's really low risk. As a result, the returns can be lower if you don't know how to structure your deal right, but if you do, they can be really high. Uh, you also get multiple sources of return when you invest in real estate. So you get cash flow, you get uh, appreciation, you get tax benefits, amortization as well. We'll go over that in more detail. You get passive income, which is that's kind of the promised land, right? That's why most people get into real estate. 
buy as much as you can, grow a portfolio. And when you've had enough, you pull the plug and you're financially independent, living on passive income, and you do whatever you want with your life. That's that's the dream, right? That's why a lot of people get into the business, certainly why I did. And you can get passive income while you're also growing the value of your assets and your net worth over time. So it's really attractive. Yeah. Um, so when you say passive income, it's like when you sell the property, so you start getting passive income, or are you talking about rental? No, I mean rental income while you own it. So you don't really necessarily ever really need to sell. You can exchange if you want, but if most people want to build a portfolio and then live off the rental income, okay. and then you do whatever you want. You could live to be 120, your income goes up. Um, highly localized markets with a lot of variance in supply and demand. So what I mean by that is, like if you think about the market for Bitcoin, to use a funny example, right? The price for Bitcoin pretty much is the price for Bitcoin at any given second. Obviously, you have exchanges that are adding fees and stuff and all that kind of jazz. But the price is what the market is going to pay. It's it's a relatively perfect market for that, or for the yield on the ten-year Treasury, or for Microsoft stock, right? You know, a ton of buyers and a ton of sellers on an exchange. Very easy to set a price. Very hard to get a discount unless you think there's something that's happening in the future about that asset that everybody else doesn't know about. With real estate, it's highly localized. So you could take a duplex in Westchester and you could show that to somebody from New York. And if they don't know anything about Westchester or Los Angeles or duplexes, they're not going to have any idea what the value of that property is. So that's kind of what I mean. It's highly localized, it's fragmented. There's an opportunity there as an investor to specialize in a given property type or a given property area and know it really well. And that's a competitive advantage versus anybody else that might be trying to participate in the market. Very different from buying something on an exchange and um, just hoping it goes up, right? You can really exploit your knowledge in the market to your benefit. Um, attractive financing options, really easy to uh, to get debt and buy property. Some of the best loans available in the country are available for real estate. That goes back to the hard asset conversation as well. The lenders are more willing to give favorable terms on loans for real estate because they can take a hard asset as collateral. They'll take it back if you don't make the payments. But for them, because that's a much more secure loan, you get really great financing terms versus, say, going to try and finance a business purchase or something like that where their collateral is less clear and, they, and they're less secure. Disadvantages, the single biggest disadvantage you hear about all the time with real estate is the lack of liquidity. So the big advantage to selling Bitcoin or Microsoft stock or a treasury bond is you log into your account and you hit sell and it's gone. And whatever price it was at when you hit sell is the price you sold it at, right? You can't really do that with real estate. Or there are some shysters that will convince you to do that with real estate and pay a you know below market price for your property. But generally speaking, if you want to sell a piece of real estate, you have to hire somebody like me. You have to market it. You have to list it for sale. You've got to talk to a whole bunch of buyers, walk them through the property, go through the due diligence process, get them approved for financing, and close the sale. So it's you can't just sell it on a dime if you need the money. It's really, it's an illiquid investment. It's one of the more illiquid investments that you can find out there. Of course, that actually protects people from themselves sometimes. If you recall COVID when that all broke out, we had a few panic sellers that sold right at the beginning of that for a bargain. And a lot of people kind of thought, ah, I'm gonna wait and see what happens. It's an illiquid property anyway. I'm not gonna sell it fast. And sure enough, six weeks later, government threw a whole bunch of money at the problem and everybody's values went way up and the people that sold in the first six weeks after COVID broke out were really bummed out. So the illiquidity did some people some favors there. Um, you have a management burden as well though. Not always, depending on how you buy, but in the most traditional sense, if you go buy directly a piece of property yourself, it is your responsibility to make that property generate income or to deal with it one way or the other, right? Now, obviously you can hire a professional property management company to take care of that for you. And I recommend that, not everybody does, but you still have to hire the property management company, deal with the tax matters, make sure the books look good, decide how much you wanna spend on renovations, make sure that it's rented for the right amount, it's staying filled, the tenants are paying, expenses are under control, right? All of that is your responsibility as an investor. 
a lot more than buying a share of stock online. On the other hand, you can invest as a real estate investor too. Fractionally, you can buy shares of REITs or you can do syndicated deals where you're a limited partner and you have no responsibility. You will give up some of the returns to do that. So there's ways to do that. But at the simplest level, there is a management burden there. Uh, and it's pretty complex. You really have to understand how it works, how the pieces fit together. You can get yourself in trouble if you don't understand it. Once again, you know, you really have to understand what your expenses are going to look like, what the income is going to look like, what you can do with the property, what's legal, what's not, you know, tenant regulations, landlord rules, all kinds of stuff. Right? It's pretty complex. And there's a high barrier to entry. If you're just going to go pop a down payment down and buy a property, you're probably spending at least $100,000. Uh, you could do an FHA loan and do less, but it's a pretty sizable capital investment for an initial purchase. You're not really going to put 100 bucks into something and make that work. You could do that again, like on a REIT or a fractionalized basis, but to really like buy a piece of property, pretty high barrier to entry. They're expensive purchases, right? Returns versus alternative investments, just to kind of set the table a little bit. Um, with leveraged real estate, you should be able to make between 15 to 30% on your money annualized. So that's a huge number versus say 10% with stocks, five to 6% with bonds, you know, or 8% for large cap US stocks. So you can really outperform if you understand the business and if you understand how compound interest works and the rule of 72 and all that jazz and you've taken finance 101, you can kill it investing in real estate without taking on a ton of risk. You can do really, really well. That's what drew me to the business. Uh, so it's really attractive. <clears throat> Questions on this before we move on? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Oh, the rule of 72 is a finance um, metric. Basically, you divide your return into 72, and that's how many years it takes to double your investment. So if you get a 36% return on your investment, in two years, your money will double. And it's possible to get a 36% return on your investment. Yes. Are you going to share the slides? Please? I'm happy to share it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So if there's anything written here, you know, I'll send them out to everybody. <laughs> okay, so within real estate, there's a lot of different options. And there's different types of properties that you can invest in. We call those asset classes. Mainly you sound fancy. Sounds good at a cocktail party or a networking thing. So if you want to impress all your friends, you know about asset classes. Uh, and there's some kind of general, real high level um, asset classes. You have residential real estate, uh, improved commercial, industrial real estate, uh, and then unimproved land. You hear people talk about multifamily, retail, office, and industrial, and land are kind of main asset classes. And then there's, you know, subcategories, there's hospitality, you know, hotels, obviously it's different, healthcare is a little bit different, specialty, you know, single family, small multifamily, large multifamily, mixed use, all these things, but really kind of, those are your broad categories. And depending on what you're into and what's interesting to you or where your background might be, you can do really well investing in any of those asset classes or all of them. Um, I've dabbled in all of them, but mostly what I do is apartment buildings because it's just really easy. Uh, so residential real estate has some advantages, uh, great return on invested capital, uh, really strong value appreciation, especially in California. Everyone needs a place to live and we don't have enough of it. And that's not changing anytime soon. So that does that for your values over time. And we'll look at some charts, although last quarter it didn't. But generally speaking, it goes up and to the right. Um, really good tax benefits. A lot of uh, tenants out there, right? For apartment building, everyone needs a place to live, right? So very easy to find tenants. It's a ubiquitous rental market, um, but it's pretty management intensive. So people that don't like apartment buildings, they usually talk about the three T's, toilets, tenants, and trash, because you have to deal with all of that, right? Now you have a property management company that'll handle that and you really don't, but it does take management. You either have to subcontract or do that yourself. Uh, improved commercial and industrial real estate has some advantages. You get really long-term leases. So it's pretty typical to have five, 10, even 20 year leases and some of that type of stuff. You know, if you have a, like a restaurant on a pad and they just have a ground lease and they build the restaurant and it's a Del Taco or something or, you know, an in and out that's a great tenant. They're never going anywhere. 
It's going to be a 10 to 20 year lease. You as the landlord lease them the dirt and they worry about everything else. Very easy, right? Uh, very limited management required. They're generally paying all the expenses. You have uh, sometimes a you know, AAA credit tenant, you know, national retailer type thing. Great value appreciation, good cash flow, but it's highly sensitive to where your real estate is. And each tenant may not be a fit for each location. So, you know, like retail is a great example. Retail and industrial real estate are especially sensitive to where your property is located. If you're not on the right signalized corner intersection and the right side of the road, you may not be an attractive site for this particular tenant versus if you have a bread and butter apartment unit in a general neighborhood, you're going to find somebody who lives there no matter what, right? So it's much more, you have to be much more careful about what you have. There's less of an availability of tenants and the financing is much harder on those properties. Bigger down payments, terms aren't as good um, and so on. And you can have really long-term vacancies with commercial. So if, you know, economic times are tough, you drive around, you see some of those big box retailers, they'll sit vacant sometimes for two years, right? While they retool and release it to somebody else. You gotta have really deep pockets as a landlord if you wanna get into that. And then there's unimproved land. So some people just buy land as an investment, zero management required, no tenants, not leasing it to anybody. Um, you could potentially experience extremely high rates of appreciation if it's in the right location, but it's that's really kind of a speculative buy. You're assuming that the land has become going to become more valuable because something is going around, on around it, or you're buying the land because you have a specialty in development and you have the ability to entitle the, line, the land. The entitlement process is what we call the process of taking basically raw and improved land through the planning approval process with cities and permitting to say, I want to build a subdivision of homes here. I'm going to get the approval to do that. So you can create value just by doing that and then sell it to somebody else to actually build the homes. So it's kind of, you know, development, developers sort of career track if you are interested in land. Not a whole lot of land around LA, but you do find small parcels that can be, that either have good zoning so they can, you know, you have a small house that could be turned into an apartment building, something like that. You see that kind of thing happening. <clears throat> uh, questions on asset classes before we move on. Cool. All right. Um, so if you haven't taken finance yet, I always want to touch on this before we get into everything else, because this is going to frame our whole conversation. So finance and investing is all about this equation, time value of money, also known as the compound interest formula. And so a pretty simple equation. This is the math that's behind any uh, financial calculator that you might play with or there's a free app that you can get on any phone that's a financial calculator. And um, you can do it in Excel. This is behind basically all investing where your money works for itself to deliver a return for you. So the variables are the FB is future value, PV is present value or your initial investment. R is the rate of return. And N is the number of years your investment compounds or works for itself. So this is really fun to play with if you just download your little financial calculator app or you've got your uh, HP 10B2 or your 12C calculator and you take your finance 101. And you can just plug in some sample numbers here and see what your returns might look like. So I told you already, you can make 15 to 30% in leveraged real estate. That would be your rate of return. R. Present value would be your initial investment. So let's say you can cobble together 50,000 bucks and buy something. That's your PV. N is the number of years you want to wait, or you just play with that number and say, well, what's that going to be worth in 10 years? And then you can calculate for future value. You see what your net worth is going to be after 10 years at a given rate of return. The numbers can be eye-popping if you play with it a little bit. <clears throat> the powerful part of this equation is right here. So it's exponential math, right? We have N is in the exponent. So that means that as we go along and you have more years n, if we put the value of your money on the y-axis and time on the x-axis and the folds of the napkin are months or years, for each following year, the slope of the graph accelerates, right? 
So the longer your money is working for you at whatever rate, each subsequent year, it'll be worth more and more and more and more. So that's why they say the rich get richer, right? If you have a billion dollars to invest, 15% of a billion bucks is a lot, right? You're going to do pretty well on your next year. You don't even need to get 15% if you have a billion dollars. You can get three, right? Most of us don't, though. So we have to try and get the highest return we possibly can so that we set ourselves up for the future. So this is the math that you're playing with in any investing. It's the math that you're working with uh, with real estate. But <laughs> the rate of return is more complicated than just saying, I'm going to plop down my down payment and this is what I'm going to make. Um, so here's just a kind of tabular representation of some of that math to illustrate how powerful this concept is. So let's look at a uh, hundred grand. Let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars to invest. So this is your present value for 10 years. If you can get a 20% return on your equity, that would be the R number. Then your money's worth $619,000 after 10 years. It's pretty good, right? Not enough to retire on. But look what happens in another five years, it goes from 619 to 1.54. So it almost triples in half the amount of time that it took you to get to the original 619. That's the shape of that graph going exponential on you. And you'll see how much more powerful it is if you can increase your returns. 931, 2.8 million, 8.6 million with the same 100 grand. If you can achieve these rates of return, <laughs> those are unusually high rates of return, right? You have to carefully manage your portfolio, apply the right amount of debt, understand what you're doing. But this is actually perfectly doable to be in the, on this chart. Very unique thing for real estate. That's just math. There's nothing unique to real estate about this chart. If you could make those returns investing in any other type of investment, you would the numbers would be the same. This is just a representation of math. So if you're going to figure out how you're going to get there, I recommend doing an investment plan. And a lot of people don't talk about this when they get into real estate investing or finance. People just want to get started and they want to talk about return percentages and that's that. Well, it's really easy to kind of confuse yourself uh, with all the terminology and the metrics. Uh, I highly recommend starting with a plan instead. And a plan can be really simple. Uh, you just got to set a goal. Where do you want to be? Why are you doing this? You know, uh, it could be a specific net worth you're shooting for. It could be a monthly passive income number you want. You could describe a lifestyle that you're trying to achieve and then quantify that lifestyle and work it backwards into being your goal. Any way you want to do it. <clears throat> um, your general plan is basically just that time value of money equation in a word problem, which I'll show you. And then your detailed plan would be like each year when you think Values of your properties, your debt, your equity, cash flow, all that. And then follow up and review constantly. So, so many people forget this. They don't do this when they start off. And they just think, I want to make some money. So I'm going to buy something. And there's all these sayings about plans, right? Yes. So if you want to ask general plan. It's like hard to read. Detailed plan. So that would be like your annual, I expect to be worth property worth this much debt, equity, cash flow, amortization. I'll show you some examples. And we actually have like downloadable little guides and books on our website that's free if you want to pull a bunch of more, more down on this kind of stuff, which is kind of nice. <clears throat> so here is, uh, this is the general plan, an example of a good general plan. One sentence, it can be just that simple. And all we're doing here is we're converting that time value of money equation into a word problem, that's it. So we could say, I'm gonna invest present value dollars for N years in real estate investments at a sustained rate of return of R percent and be worth future value dollars at the end of the plan. Does that make sense now that we put it in a word problem? A little easier to understand? So thinking about it that way, you probably know how much you have to start with or whenever you would get started. Like let's say it's that $100,000 number, you would plug that in there. And you're thinking to yourself, I want to be done in 20 years. So I'm going to plug that in here. And then I've researched my local market and figured out kind of what strategy I want to run. And I think I can probably average a 20% return across the 20 years. So spit out the calculation and there you have it. 
think that example is 100 for 20 years, you'd be worth $3.8 million. And that would be with no additional capital invested. In reality, you're actually going to probably invest more capital as you make money and people get more into this and it gets way more complicated. Than that. But this is just super basic, like high level. If you were to run it that way, this is how it would sound. <clears throat> and here's the detailed plan. So to your question earlier, this is what you would put in a detailed plan. So your goals, market value, gross equity, income estimates on a year by year basis, cash account, tax account, net of both accounts, and a detailed year by year financial parameter estimate for all the other parameters that you want to have. So maybe this is overkill if you're just getting started. Uh, but if you really want to get detailed, you can do this. <clears throat> and then exit strategies. So a lot of times when you talk to people about investing in real estate, first question is, yeah, that sounds great. I can buy a property and it's worth more, but like, what do I do with that? Right? We talked about it being illiquid. Um, there's significant tax consequences depending on what you do with your portfolio. And so if you're starting to think about being a real estate investor, you have to start thinking about what your exit strategy might be. And there's lots of different options. The nice thing is, is there's, there's multiple exit strategies. <laughs> and with each deal, different deals will have different exit strategies. But at a portfolio level, these are probably some of the most common, simple exit strategies you can think of. So number one would be just liquidate as necessary, right? Sell it right up in the sunset. That works. But if you do that, the government is coming for most of your money. So not a great option, but you can do it if you have to. Money is yours, right? You can own it for passive cash flow. So this is what we were talking about early. So you just, the plan would be not to sell, no exit. Your exit is to chill out. Maybe you stop acquiring as many properties. You let the debt amortize and pay down over time. You let the rents rise as market rents rise in the area. And you just live off the cash flow. That's probably most people's uh, exit strategy. Getting into the business is basically develop a portfolio such that you can live financially independently. And you can, you can refinance for lump sum withdrawals. So anytime you put new debt on a property, if you can get a bigger loan than what you had, you can cash out. So we call that a cash out refi. That cash is yours. You can use it to buy another property and put that into the plan and continue to roll or buy a house or a boat or a Ferrari or whatever, if you want. A lot of people in real life, it, it, you know, in reality, will use a combination of these two, right? If you have like a big, big ticket item you need to get, like you want to buy a house for yourself, you might do a cash out refi, and then you'll still own a bunch of properties and let them, you know, deliver passive income for you so you can live. Uh, and then another option, which is actually kind of coming back, and we haven't seen this in a big way in like 20 years or so, is sell and carry financing. So if you are an owner of real estate and you've owned a property for a long time and it's paid off or the loan balance is low, you could sell the property and then be the bank. You could carry back paper, extend credit to the buyer, and then they owe you the interest payments just as if you were a bank, right? So that used to be really common in the 70s and 80s. The last time we had a lot of inflation around and interest rates were higher, it's back now. So we've been doing a lot of seller carry deals in our office lately because it's really hard to finance um, purchases right now with the banks. Yes. So like a cash out refi, what it's called? Uh, cash out refi would be, yeah, this one here. So that's like a strategic way to avoid paying tax. Absolutely, yeah. Typically a cash out refi is not a taxable event, or at least the proceeds from the refi are not taxable. Is that unique to real estate or is that concept? No, that's pretty much, I mean, debt generally is not taxable. Right, so if you own a company and you want to put a bunch of debt on the company, it would be the same idea. Yeah, I mean, generally debt proceeds are not taxable. Uh, real estate works particularly well because there's a lot of debt available for real estate. So it's a really common strategy. But yeah, I mean, typically debt proceeds are not taxable. Yeah, yes. On that topic, we had a Zoom question. Mm -hmm. Are there any big disadvantages to refinancing for lump sum withdrawals? Yes. Uh, big disadvantages for refinancing for lump sum withdrawals. Well, the biggest disadvantage is you owe the money now. <laughs> so
to be super obvious about it, right? If you had a $500,000 loan and you take a refi for 700,000, which gives you 200,000 cash out, right? Because you paid off the $500,000 loan. Guess what? You owe $700,000 to the bank now. So that means probably your payments are going up and your equity in the property went down. So there's a trade-off. You have to decide when that's appropriate for you to do and when it's not. The math is such that in a lot of cases, if you've got a lot of equity in your property, you may want to do a cash out refi to re-leverage, which increases the return. I'm going to show you how that works in a little while and buy something else with that. But at the end of the day, you are taking on more debt. Anytime you take on more debt, you add to your risk level, you add to your debt service payments, and you need to consider that. Right now, there's a lot of people not doing refis that would have done it otherwise, right? Because rates went from three and a half percent to seven percent last year. So somebody that might have done a cash out refi at the beginning of last year is looking at that prospect and thinking that's not attractive at all because, you know, not only is my debt level going to rise, but my payments are going to jump by a ton because I'm going to have higher debt and I'm paying double the interest rate that I would have last year. So there's always drawbacks to taking on more debt done responsibly and with the right amount of leverage. It will actually increase your returns, but you have to understand how those pieces fit together and make the right decision. Is there another question on that too? Or run your exit strategies? Yep. Cool. So yeah, um, seller carry is back. Yeah. You have one more question. You might want to wait until later though, but they ask, can you describe what a tax shelter is and why it's important? We're going to cover that in detail. Yeah, later. <clears throat> okay, so within that R number, the rate of return, real estate has four elements of return. So it's not as simple as saying, I'm going to put my money in the savings account and here's my interest rate. An interest rate is the same idea as the rate of return. It's just lower. With real estate, you get appreciation, cash flow, equity buildup through amortization, and tax shelter benefits. So quantifying all of these together is that combined rate of return that you can get on your money. That was going back to our time value money equation. That's that R number. So there's four different components of that R number. <clears throat> the simplest one is cash flow, right? Just as a percentage of your investment, how much cash is coming back to you, depending on where you invest and what you buy, that's going to vary widely. Uh, in our market right now, I see deals that range, range from like negative 10% to like positive 5% or so, depending on how you, you finance it. Appreciation is just the increase in value over time. Properties generally go up over time. Um, They've actually gone down over the last quarter for the first time since 2011. So we're in an interesting market right now. Uh, but generally, over a long period of time, they go up. Uh, equity growth through amortization is the principal being paid down on your loan. So if you buy real estate with a loan, your tenants are typically the ones making your mortgage payments for you because they're paying your rent. And you're using that to make your mortgage payment. The part that goes to paying off the loan is yours, right? Because your loan balance is less, which means when you sell or you refinance your property and take cash out, that's your money. We call that equity buildup through amortization. If you own the property long enough, your tenants would actually then pay the entire loan off for you. So that's an element of return that could be incorporated into R. And then the tax shelter benefits. So real estate has some amazing tax benefits, especially in the United States. Uh, you can do what's called a 1031 tax deferred exchange, which allows you to sell property and buy another one while deferring your taxes, not paying any taxes. And then you also get to write off the value of the structure or the improvements, as the IRS calls it, over a given time period. That's book depreciation. You basically just get to write off the structure because the um, IRS agrees that over time, your building depreciates, right? Even though it appreciates in value, your building experiences wear and tear, and they allow you to take some book depreciation um, for that. So if we add all these, all these together, you get that combined rate of return. So we're going to go into each one in a little bit of detail. So first of all, calculating appreciation. So appreciation is uh, the increase in value of the property over time. And it's not just magic. A lot of people think that it is, but it happens naturally through economic forces. There's two components of appreciation. You have inflationary appreciation, which is happening everywhere right now, right? We're in an inflationary environment in the economy. Inflation is currently around 7%. Uh, 
I think it went down into the sixes after the last report came out. Um, but that's an increase in pricing across the whole economy. And obviously that affects real estate too. And then you have demand-based appreciation. So to the extent that there's more demand or people want to buy or rent properties in a given area of a given asset class more than they did last year or the year before, that causes the value and pricing and properties in the area to increase as well. So combine those together and you get the market rate of appreciation each year on a piece of property, which is pretty easy to determine just by looking at sales statistics and seeing, you read those articles all the time. Properties went up by X percent, down by X percent, whatever. Um, so inflation is measured through CPI. You're probably reading all about that right now if you're in the business school, learning all about inflation for the first time since the 70s. Um, and real estate investing is an excellent hedge against inflation. The reason is if you're using debt to buy a piece of property, you're borrowing in today's dollars and you only, you're paying the lender back, the bank back in tomorrow's dollars. So as the value of dollars becomes less and less and less, a million dollars today is worth less tomorrow. So you'd rather pay a million dollars borrowed today back in tomorrow's dollars or next year's dollars or dollars from 10 years from now, right? So huge hedge against inflation. The lender loses in an inflationary environment. And they know that. That's why the interest rates are higher right now. <laughs> but you can still be a winner uh, investing in that kind of environment. And then we talked about the you know, upward pressure of value from demand would be related to things like job growth, population growth, supply of land. We have no supply here. That's the main thing in LA. There's nowhere to build more units. So we have a lot of increased demand. So looking at this over a long period of time, <laughs> excuse me, here's 56 years of um, 57 years, excuse me, of values going back to 1965 in our local area. So our company has been around since the 1960s. Actually, this is our 60th anniversary. We took the company over um, in 2017 from some of the original founders. And we've been keeping track of this data locally since 1965. So in 1965, a uh, apartment building in our general area, this would be from like about LMU down through Long Beach. We call this the Greater South Bay. An apartment building in that at that time averaged $14 a square foot. That was the average sale price in 1965. In 2022, uh, the average sale price was $518 per square foot in that area. So this would be like two units and above. So duplexes, 10 units, 20 units, 40 units. This doesn't include houses, doesn't include like stores, retail, office, industrial. This is just apartment buildings. But suffice it to say, over time, the value goes up very consistently, right? Not every year because we have the business cycles, right? In the early 70s, it went down by a little bit. This is the last time we had a lot of inflation going on here up to the early 80s. And the rates were 20% or so here. Slid down to 85 bucks a square foot in 1983. Expansion again until the early 90s to 140. And then a, long, a pretty long recession in the early 90s. That was savings and loan crisis. Went from 140 down to 114. Subprime boom up to 329. Subprime crisis, 205. And here we are from 205 to 518. So, you know, the message is not that Real estate goes up every year because it doesn't, but over a long enough time horizon, it does. And so if you look at the patterns on this chart, we always surpass our previous high. Whenever we have a downturn and we come back, we always surpass our previous high. So if you buy with a long-term strategy and a long-term time horizon, and you don't over leverage yourself, you buy so you're never forced to sell, you're basically gonna take advantage of that number. That's your average annual rate of appreciation on property in this area. And so that's just rate of return number one, that's from appreciation, right? Six and a half percent. Pretty interesting stuff. Who knows where it goes from here? We're actually on the way down. I don't know how low we're gonna get. I personally think that we're, this is the most similar time period to where we are right now in recent economic history. I think we're gonna go down a little bit, be flat for a while. That's just me. Yes. 
What's the difference between the ways we can uh, compare in different areas? Great question. So uh, the question was, what's the difference in the rate of return comparing different areas? Uh, the answer is it totally, there's a trade-off on where you make your returns depending on what area you're in. So um, to go back, there's a trade-off between cash flow and appreciation. So generally the less expensive areas that don't appreciate as much have higher cash flow and the higher cash flow areas don't appreciate as much. So it varies widely. You can't just say like, well, returns are higher here because it's here. It's not that simple. It's that yields are higher in one place versus appreciation in another. And it varies widely. There's a metric called a cap rate, which we'll talk about in a little while. That is a nice way to compare different areas to each other based on the yield that properties generate. And there's an inverse relationship between the cap rate and appreciation. But I'll get into those details in a minute because that gets confusing. But great question. <clears throat> Here's the inflation adjusted version of the same chart. Yes. Um, is this specific to multifamily or is this cross home? These charts are specific to multifamily. But the metrics in the strategy, this is all commercial real estate, everything. You would use cap rate, you would use all the terminology we're going to talk about, you would use in any of the other asset classes too. But the charts I'm showing you are just specific to multiple. So inflation adjusted, this is kind of interesting. Same chart. So this would be in 2022 dollars. In 1965, we're at 123 bucks. So you still have that positive trend, uh, but this is all in 2022 dollars. So this is backing inflation out of the picture. So this is an illustration of the increased demand over this 57 year time period, right? Remember the two elements of appreciation are the inflation-based driver and the demand-based driver. So this is just demand when still, you know, multiply things by four times during that time period, because there's that many more people and demand for the land here in, in our area. So cash flow, pretty simple to calculate this. You can do it on Excel, you could do it on a cocktail napkin, you can do it anywhere. Uh, basically, you create an income statement, just like you would for any company, except your company is a building. And uh, very simple. So instead of gross sales or revenue like you'd have on a company, we would call this gross scheduled rents. Uh, after that, you take out a vacancy allowance. So we're going to estimate what we think vacancy rates going to be in our area for apartment buildings in this area most people use five percent as a vacancy allowance because you do get some turnover plus other income so other income would include like garage rental laundry income stuff like that car charging stations whatever that gives you your effective gross income after effective gross income you subtract your operating expenses so your operating expenses would include things like property taxes insurance management, maintenance, utilities, repairs, all that kind of stuff that it takes to run a building. That gives you what's called your net operating income, which is a very important metric. Your net operating income is basically the building's profit before you apply any debt. <coughs> different people could own a building with different financing structures. So we use the net operating income a lot to compare one building versus another. Whereas cash flow is highly personal because you might finance different buildings in different ways or different people might use that or not use that or have different terms. After net operating income, you take out the debt service. That is just a fancy term for mortgage payments. After the debt service, you arrive at cash flow. So that is the spendable money that goes in your pocket from owning the property. Cash flow is the only of the four elements of return that you can spend on a monthly basis. So for a lot of people, this is kind of the ultimate goal. When you're getting into owning property, you're trying to develop a portfolio large enough that it can deliver enough cash flow for you to live comfortably and not need to work, or you work because you want to. That's ultimate goal for a lot of people. And then you can use different ratios and um, metrics to compare different parts of the income statement to each other and use that to analyze buildings. The same way that you would do that with companies, if you've taken like managerial accounting, or you're trying to value companies and you're looking at M&As or something like that. We do this with apartment buildings too, by comparing these ratios to each other. It's just a lot easier because you're not trying to guess what's going on behind some company with a whole bunch of employees and a proprietary business model. You're just working on a building. 
So that's cash flow. Equity buildup is just the principal pay down on your loan. So I mentioned this earlier. This is your tenants paying your loan for you. Um, simple example here. If you've got a $1.2 million property, a $900,000 mortgage balance, because you put it 25% down. Uh, I wrote this presentation a year ago, so the rate is out of date, but excuse me. Uh, at 4% mortgage, your monthly interest payment would be $29.76. Your principal, principal payment would be $13.20. Your total payment is forty three hundred bucks, but this thirteen twenty goes to paying down the balance of your loan. That's yours when you sell a property or when you refi. So you can count that as part of your return. You actually pay taxes on that too, because debt reduction is taxable. And then um, you also get the ten thirty one exchange, which I mentioned. Ten thirty one exchanges allows you to sell a property and defer the cap paying the capital gains on it as long as you buy another property within one hundred and eighty days. Um, the trick is you have to identify a property that you want to buy within 45 days. You actually can identify three of which you must buy one. There's a couple other rules too. It gets very complicated. Um, if you've met Edgar Asensio on the React, he does a whole class on 1031 exchanges. If that's something that you're interested in, it's a key part of most real estate investor strategies for growing your portfolio. And it's an amazing way to, to build a larger set of buildings without any taxes. Um, you also get the depreciation deduction. So to the earlier question about tax shelter benefits, um, the IRS allows you to take book depreciation on the value of the structure on residential properties over 27 and a half years. So if you have a million dollar structure divided by 27 and a half, you can take that as a write-off versus the cash flow that the building generates every year. So amazing benefit for owning properties. It's free, something everybody's entitled to. On commercial properties, it's 39 years, so it's a little bit longer. Um, and you can do real fancy stuff with depreciation if you want. You can do stuff called cost segregation studies and accelerated depreciation and bonus depreciation. And if you want to get really fancy, you cannot ever pay federal income taxes again if you're a real estate investor and you know what you're doing. Pretty cool. So lots of tax benefits for investing. You get to keep all your money. Must but you got to play by the rules. Okay, so um, back to the trade off versus appreciation versus, versus cash flow. So, this was a kind of a key concept we touched on earlier with a question. As we start to learn about um, analyzing an individual deal, and we're going to get into like a sample deal later so that all this becomes less academic and starts making a little bit more sense, you have to start asking yourself what is your priority? You can choose, right? There is generally a trade off between properties that cash flow more versus properties that appreciate more. There's also a middle ground, properties that have some of each. That's probably where most people end up. Uh, but the market is such that there's a very clear trade off between the two. Properties that look like they're going to cash flow a ton on paper probably aren't going to go up in value very much. So that would generally be properties that are in less desirable areas. Maybe they're out in the middle of nowhere, like a rural area where there's not a lot of jobs or something like that. Um, maybe there's only one employer in town versus anything around here that would be super in demand, right? Because there's so many people. The property in the middle of nowhere is going to look like it has higher cash flow, assuming you can manage it well, versus the property here is going to appreciate a lot more than that other property. Yes? Do you really have a choice investment? Don't you go and wait for the court? Do you yeah, have a choice? You absolutely have a choice. Sure, yeah. No, you absolutely have a choice. Yeah, you, you can buy a cheaper property in a higher appreciation area and still take advantage of higher appreciation rates. Or you can buy a cheaper property in a high cash flow area if the cash flow is more important to you. Yeah, you absolutely have a choice. Um, <clears throat> so here's an interesting example of that, of the trade-off. So perhaps a less extreme example, but we have Manhattan Beach and Hawthorne here. So similar chart to what I showed you before, these are values between 71 and 2011 in each of these cities. So in Manhattan Beach, the 40 year rate during that time period of appreciation was 9%. And in Hawthorne, the 40 year rate of appreciation during that time period was 6%. So Hawthorne appreciated less, Manhattan Beach appreciated more. So most people would look at that and say, I want the Manhattan Beach property, please, right? 
problem is the Manhattan Beach property probably loses money every month for the privilege of owning that property unless you own it all cash. And because you can use more debt to buy this one, if you do the math, the Hawthorne property probably actually has a higher rate of return than the Manhattan Beach property, even though the appreciation rate is less. <clears throat> There's that study again. I can't remember why I threw that in the video. <clears throat> so um, that gets us into kind of comparing different areas and different property types to each other using the same metrics that all the commercial real estate investors would use. So uh, if you take nothing else away from today, I want you to understand how leverage affects your returns and what you pick. And that's what we're going to look at now. So you have to understand the income metrics first and then the impact of leverage on your returns. So this is probably the densest, most useful slide in the presentation. These are a bunch of formulas. Um, and I'm going to write them here because we're going to refer back to this. <laughs> So we have the cap rate. Oops, here we go. So I mentioned this earlier. The cap rate is, and we've kind of learned about some of these. Um, I think that's the, the net operating income divided by the building's price. Or value, and then you have the GRM. That's the gross rent multiplier. And that is the building's price or value divided by the gross scheduled rents. So you're now starting to see all of those income statement line items that I was talking about earlier. <clears throat> so we use these metrics probably more than any other to compare properties to each other and do some quick back of the envelope analysis in our heads as to how each one might uh, perform if you were gonna buy them or to value them for that matter. So um, very simple, like a, a, a GRM, I'm gonna do this first because it's easier to understand. Let's say we have, a $1.5 million property, that's the price. And that $1.5 million property generates $100,000 in gross scheduled rents. So the rent roll is $100,000 divided by 12 for 12 months of the year. We would say that the GRM for this building is 15. So the gross rent multiplier on this building is 15, which I'm sure you can understand the math. But you're probably looking at that and thinking, yeah, but what, what does that mean? I don't care. Uh, well, if you think about it, 15 mathematically is the same as 50, saying 15 divided by one, right? So this is also like saying this building costs $15 in purchase price for every $1 of annual rent revenue. So when you think about it that way, it becomes really easy to compare buildings to each other. So I would rather buy the same building for 1.4 million, right? If this same building generates 100,000 bucks in gross rent revenue per year, I'd rather pay 1.4 million for it. If I pay 1.4 million for it, my GRM on purchase is 14. That means then I pay $14 for every $1 in annual rent revenue instead of 15. If I pay $16 for it, I'm getting a worse deal, right? What we can do now is we can take that methodology and we can pull a bunch of sales comparables from similar area of similar size buildings in similar condition and do the GRM math on it and say, well, all the closed sales comps sold for 17, a GRM of 17, or we would call that 17 times gross. So if other investors paid $17 for every $1 of annual rent revenue on the comps, and I have this deal that's being presented to me at $15 for every $1 of annual rent revenue, it's a good deal, right? Relative to the market, maybe I should consider buying it if it works for me financially for my plan. Now, just because it's a good deal relative to the market doesn't mean it's the property that you should buy, but it's a potential indication that it's a good deal. 
by the same ticket, the cap rate is the same idea, but it's a percentage because the income is in the numerator instead of the denominator, and it's on net income instead of gross revenue. So NOI, if you recall, our uh, income statement is gross revenue minus all the expenses and vacancy. Typically on your average apartment deal around here, apartment building, expenses are probably gonna run about 35% of the gross revenue. And so this, this calculation for the same building is probably gonna be $65,000 divided by $1.5 million property. Does that make sense? Because if there's 35% expenses, our net operating income after our 100,000 gross is gonna end up at 65,000. So our NOI in this building is 65 grand and our cap rate is 4.3%. Same building, these are uh, complementary, you know, the same metrics to describe the same thing basically. So 4.3% cap rate. Now, what does that mean? So cap rate for a lot of people makes a little bit more sense than the gross rent multiplier. That what the cap rate means is that this building on your $1.5 million invested yields you 4.3% on your invested capital before the debt. So you're ignoring the debt right now. The yield on that property is 4.3. If you're in finance and you're looking at investments and you've learned about this stuff already, you mess around with stocks and bonds and all that kind of thing, you understand that yield is a pretty critical metric for valuing anything, any kind of investment, right? So bond yield, very similar to this. The lower the bond yield, the more valuable, the more expensive the bond, right? The higher the bond yield, the cheaper the bond. Same thing here. <laughs> this is that inverse relationship, the trade-off between cash flow and value, because cap rates in investment properties are just like a bond yield in the fixed income market, or like dividends in stock. So if we say that the going cap rate in this area is 4.3%, Okay, that allows us to establish if we have another property that has 130,000 in NOI that's next door, it's probably worth three million bucks, right? Because if we apply the same ratios, take $130,000 divided by 0.043 cap rate for the market, three million dollars. Same idea. So this allows you to value property just like the GRM does. And the more that investors are willing to pay for a property is going to push the yield down. So the same thing, just like with the bond market, right? So if we look at different areas of LA, and I'll show you this in a little while, expensive parts of town have really low cap rates. Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach, right? All the beach towns, 2%, maybe 3% cap rate. Very low cash flow, but high appreciation, right? Low cap rate, high appreciation. By the opposite ticket, a apartment building in uh, Barstow, apologies to anybody from Barstow, uh, probably a very high cap rate, very low appreciation. You can probably find an 8% cap rate in Barstow and you'll make great cash flow if you've got a management team out there, much better than you would in Manhattan Beach, but the property will not go in there much. That kind of makes sense? So this is the yield investors are willing to accept for invested capital in the market. Uh, debt coverage ratio is what we use to do commercial loan underwriting. And so this is what's gonna tell us what different properties, what they qualify for as far as debt. So the lender on a commercial deal, this is what's really interesting about investment property. They don't care about your own finances. Once you get into commercial loans, five units and above or retail industrial office, they care what the property generates for NOI, and they're going to tell you, okay, our mortgage rate is 6% based on the NOI that we've underwritten on this property. The property qualifies for X dollars. And there's your loan. And if you have the money to put down, you can buy the property. That's simple. You can have as much of that as you want. And in fact, you get better terms the more debt that you have when you get into the commercial real estate space. And I'll show you how that works on a spreadsheet when we do an example property. Uh, and then you have the mortgage constant. This is the percent of money paid each year to pay or service the debt. Given the total value of the loan, the math on that is it's the annual debt service divided by the loan amount. It's kind of a confusing concept. What it is, is it's similar to the interest rate, but it includes the principal part of the payment. And so uh, as a straight up 
you know, apples to apples comparison of your payment to the yield. If your mortgage constant is lower than your cap rate, you will be positive cash flow. Even if you um, invest with zero down, because the money you're borrowing is working harder for you in the property than the cost that you're paying to borrow it from the bank. Not possible right now because cap rates are in the fours and interest rates are in the sixes. <laughs> yes. Can you repeat one more time which one has to be higher than positive cash flow? So positive cash flow is possible depending on your down payment, pretty much in any property that has a positive cap rate. But for the mortgage constant, if the mortgage constant is below the cap rate, a property will be positively cash flowing even with zero down or 100% debt. Now, in today's debt market, no lender is going to give you zero down or 100% debt unless you are a veteran and you go get a VA loan, which I highly recommend, by the way. Those are the best loans in the entire market. Generally not possible, but mathematically speaking, that's how that works. Um, and then the leverage factor is really interesting, too. So the leverage factor, you're multiplying. Let me see if I have an example. Yep. Here's, here's how we explain the leverage factor. So the magic of investing in real estate and how you can get those super high rates of return without taking on a ton of risk is through a concept called leveraged appreciation. Leveraged appreciation is the idea that you're buying a property with some of your own money as a down payment. You're borrowing the rest of the purchase price, generally the majority of the purchase price you're borrowing. But as the property appreciates in value, like we looked at on that 56 year chart, the appreciation is yours. Your loan balance does not go up, right? As the property appreciates. If you borrow a million bucks and your property appreciates from 1.2 million to 1.5 million, the $300,000 Delta is yours if you sell the property or if you do a cash out refi. So <clears throat> mathematically represented the idea that you are only participating um, as far as skin in the game goes in a portion of the purchase, but you are, garnering 100% of the appreciation's benefit, we call that leveraged appreciation. Sounds really confusing. The best way to explain it is with a simple example like this. So let's say you've got 500 grand to invest, right? You sold a business, way to go. Somebody paid you half a million bucks for it. And you're gonna go buy a investment property with that money. You could, use that all cash and go buy like a little condo and rent that out. You were raised to believe all debt is bad and you should avoid it if you could pay something cash. That was the way I was raised. I had to get away from that. Um, <clears throat> so $500,000 purchase price. If that property goes up at 5% in year one, that's 25,000 bucks. It's worth 525 in year two. And your return on equity in this example is $25,000, your, your appreciation amount divided by your down payment, which in this example was the purchase price because you bought it cash. Your down payment and the purchase price is one and the same, right? So your ROE in this example is 5%, same as the appreciation rate. Now, if instead you took the same 500 grand down and you bought a $2 million property at 75% loan to value, which you can absolutely do, 5% of 2 million bucks is $100,000. That's yours. Property's worth 2.1 million in the next year. And you made $100,000, again, divided by your down payment, not the purchase price, the money you have in the deal. So you made 20% on your money or 100 grand using the same down payment. So it looks like a little silly cocktail napkin trick, but that's actually how it works. That's how people make such high returns investing in real estate. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Zoom. Um, is there a formula or percentage that we should use for ROE to ensure that we cover all our tax and maintenance expenses? And what would be considered a good buy? Great question. Um, I'm going to answer that with the example of the case study when we when we come to it. <clears throat> we're going to try and bring it all together because that's we're trying to build the concepts here so that we understand. And then we're going to bust out a spreadsheet. We're going to look at a real building and we're going to decide if it makes sense or not. Put it all together. Awesome question. That's why we're here today. Um, <clears throat> so here's leverage appreciation, right? You make four times the amount of money that you would have here 
by buying with debt. So that's the leverage factor. The leverage factor here is four because you multiply your return by four. So to get back to, to this idea, it's the inverse of the percentage of equity where there's the reciprocal percentage of equity. So if you think about it, you can make 20% from appreciation. You can make three to 5% from cash flow. You get principal pay down of three to 5%. You get tax shelter benefits. Add all that together to be that combined rate of return number. And it doesn't sound so crazy to get your returns up into the 20s now, right? Like I showed you in those original charts. This is what got me really excited about real estate in general when I first learned this stuff. Because these, these are like gambling high numbers, right? Like you should not be able to make that kind of return on your money in most like investment marketplaces. That's unusually high rates of return for the level of risk you take on if you apply the right financing structure in real estate. Very enticing. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the problem is though, you can't just go buy any deal with 25% down and have that all work out nicely for you. Because the reality is, is there's a wide variety of pricing. The rents are different on every property. Expenses are different on every property. Cap rates and GRM are different on every property in every area. So you can't just throw a dart at the board and say, I'm going to buy this one in Westchester. I'm going to put 25% down. And Anthony told me I'm going to get 25% of my money. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the lender won't even let you do it, especially if you're buying five and up. If you buy two to four units, the lender will let you do that, at which point you might lose money if you don't do the analysis correctly. So we use something called debt coverage ratio analysis, and lenders do this to identify how much they're going to loan to you. So I mentioned this when we talked about this earlier, but the debt coverage ratio is just the, let me write this down, BCR is the NOI divided by the debt service. The debt service is just the mortgage payments. And generally, lenders want that to be greater than or equal to 1.2. So what does that mean? That means if you look at, at the equation, if we remember what NOI is, right? NOI is the net operating income before the debt service, before the mortgage payments then the lender wants you to have a 20% pad on top of your net operating income above what it takes to make the annual mortgage payments. So the lender, and they're only gonna loan to you such that you get 120% or higher. So what that means is that commercial lenders are gonna force you to cash flow when you buy a building. They're gonna make you make 20% on top of your mortgage payments. That's pretty good. That's a good thing. You're protecting consumers. We're not foreclosing on property. People have positively cash flowing properties. And that's how you do the math. The only problem is if you do that math to the, a property with a cap rate like the ones, congratulations, you can buy a property with 90% down and it qualifies for like no debt. So you have to get a high enough cap rate in order to support a debt coverage ratio to allow enough leverage to give you a leverage factor as high as possible to multiply your leveraged appreciation and deliver the returns that we've been talking about. I know that's a lot. <laughs> we have Excel for these things, but that's what I want you to try and take a crack at understanding today is how all this stuff is interrelated and how it works. Almost a break time, don't worry. <clears throat> Actually, so this is probably a good time to take a break. So here's our, this is going to be our case study building. And we'll put all this stuff together. Let's take uh, 10 minutes and we'll, we'll put it together when we get time. <laughs> That's only if you can like a monthly payback with that. Right. So exactly. if you take like a hundred grand, mm -hmm. you buy like over the five hundred grand, right. that's like you don't have to pay no, any, no. any, any debt. So like that's less racing. True. Sure. Less reward. Correct. So that's absolutely everything. That's the trade off. Right there. Okay. That's the idea. So yeah, I mean, one hundred percent cash, low risk, lots of cash flow, lower returns. Okay. More debt, more risk, higher returns, lower cash flow. So. What you're basically saying is, let's say we have $10 million. So everyone has taken an investment of $500,000. It's better to 
do it with them because you can possibly pay back the like, if you the pick the right property. Yeah. But yes, you make much higher returns by using that. If you use the right amount of debt on the right. Okay. That's the trick. It doesn't work on every side. Okay. It's pick it up. So that's what we're gonna do with the example is try and show you how to do it. Okay. But you're exactly right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Hello. Hi. My name is Janae. I'm currently, I don't know, I'm getting close to this. Oh, yeah, I did. I did. I did. It's good. Straightforward. Easy. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I just, I did it. I don't know. Yeah. What was your method? Because right now I'm just reading the basement. But it's taking a long time. Um, I think I just did the layer that you just cycle through the answers that takes you through each module. Really? Where do you have it? It's just something very simple. Um, it was Allied Real Estate School. Yeah, that's who I recommend all the agents. And you just, it's like an online platform. Yeah, yeah. similar like you for any course. Could I bring my laptop? Sure, I'll show you. All right. In a minute, I'm just going to help us with it. So I can this one again. Yeah. Uh, I'm much more than the Yeah, there was another one called Long Blow that had videos and then it came in below. Yeah, it was like a Yeah, it was like a Okay, so uh, for those of us that are here right now, I'm going to really quickly run through some of the upcoming CBA events. Um, if you want a career in real estate, show of hands, how much, how much of us want a career in real estate, potentially? Yeah, good amount. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through this. So uh, I want to tell you, first tell you about NAOP. Um, they recently, well, they do a lot of events just for the general industry and for students as well. There's a $50 one-time membership, and you get access to all their events until you graduate. Uh, they also have an ongoing mentorship program where they'll pair you up with like an actual like real industry professional and you'll get to work with them uh, directly. So last week they did like a kickoff and we got to hear from David Bender from Newmark. Uh, he gave us a market outlook. Dude, it's just a really good value. Um, NAOP, I'm going to send this, this PowerPoint out to everybody at the end, but you should really join here. 50 bucks, really good value. Um, there's also an upcoming event uh, through the ULI. Um, and this is specifically tailored to women. Uh, so this opportunity is to learn about the industry to get potential internships. Um, but I believe that the information session is open to everyone. Uh, so this is the QR code to register. Uh, you can also go to ULI's website to join the organization. 
Uh, and then there's also a, sorry, that's not tomorrow. This is tomorrow. Um, Paths to home, owner, home ownership. This is going to be in the VBA Welcome Center. Uh, we're going to hear from Edgar Asensio, who Anthony was just telling about, us about. He's in the 1031 Exchange specialty. Uh, so we're going to hear from him. Uh, this is tomorrow, VBA Welcome Center, if you can make it cool. Um, and then this is Project Destin. So if you guys are looking for an internship, uh, they do completely virtual internships. They're spring, summer, and fall uh, semesters. Uh, here are some of the companies that they work with. Work with. I'm sure you recognize almost all of these, right? These are pretty big names. Uh, but they have over 250 different companies that they, that they get sponsored by. Um, so if you want to learn more, projectdestin.com. And then I'm just going to take you guys through a, a schedule of the upcoming real estate seminars. Take a picture of this. Write this down if you don't have it already. Um, this is just the dates for everything. I don't know off the top of my head which ones are required for the program, but you do have to go to the good majority of these uh, to get the certificate. Uh, yeah, this semester. And I think that's all I have. Yeah. Um, thanks, guys. All right, everybody back. Ready to roll? I just uh, told you that I think that's the last thing. So you'll be able to make some shape Um, it's very short because we can. I'll pick it up. Wait, tomorrow? You know, actually, because you're volunteering on the other event, right? Yeah, so I just put it Yeah, I can do it. Sure. I just realized that I made it to the uh, town yesterday, tomorrow, but I can't make that sound. Oh, because you're going to get the banana. Yeah. 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 And now, essentially, we're in my BDA. Yeah, it's easy. I love saying it's cool. You know where that is. I've got to fix it. Let's stop now. All right. Yeah, jump back into it. There we go. Everyone ready to try it on a real one? Yeah. Okay, sweet. So, this fine specimen of small apartment building is mine, uh, so I can use it. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> this is a six unit apartment building in Long Beach. Uh, I bought this property in 20, I think I got it in 2015, 16, I can't remember, a while ago. Um, it's just got six one bedroom units, very simple, down in Alamitos Beach, retro row area, if you know Long Beach at all. Uh, it's 3,500 square feet. And um, I bought it for 900,000 back in the day. 
I fixed it up. Uh, I think it's actually probably worth probably more like 1.8 now, maybe 1.7. Uh, but when I put this example together, 1.5 was about the right number, I think. So let's just see how that looks. So it has six units. The gross scheduled income of this property is $107,000. So knowing that right off the bat, we could pretty much, we have pretty much everything we need to analyze this deal with what's on this screen right now, which sounds crazy because there's almost no information on this screen right now, right? All we have is the bedroom bath count, unit count, a price, square footage, and gross schedule rents. But if you think about it, we can totally do it. <laughs> Should we give it a crack? So before I even open up Excel, based on what we were looking at before, are there any metrics that we can calculate right off the bat with the information right in front of us? We can get the gross rate multiplier. And how would we do that? Multiplies, which is 1.5 million divided by the gross schedule. Sure enough. 107424. So our GRM is 13.96. Is it a good deal? Trick question. We don't know. We would have to know the going GRM in the area to tell us if it's a good deal. Well, we would. But now we know the GRM, right? So knowing that, is there some maybe there's a couple other things we might be able to figure out here? Uh, we can use some pretty basic analysis that you might use with a house too to value some multifamily property. We can do price per square foot analysis. So 426 a foot. Pretty simple. Okay. Again, who knows if that's good or not? Because we need cups, right? And uh, we can probably figure out the rent situation too. So we know we have six one bedroom units, right? And we have 107,424 in gross scheduled income. Do we know what those units are running for? We do. We could go 107,424 divided by 12 months. There's our monthly rent roll divided by six units. So the units are rented on average for $14.92 each. Make sense? So basically we have like three data points here. We just figured out a whole bunch of stuff. So now we could go online. We could look at apartments.com. We could look at Zillow. We could look at Rentometer. And we could see maybe there's an opportunity to raise rents. Maybe this lazy owner has left his rents low and you could buy the building and raise rents and do better. Or maybe he's underpriced it because the price per square foot of the GRM is too low or something. We don't know. But we can do all the math now basically with just what we have here. So let's try it on a super simple example. So I wrote an Excel worksheet for this. <laughs> Anybody can put this together in like five minutes. And we can just enter in all the metrics from any property you want. And it's going to spit out all of the stuff that we learned how to do in the first half of the class, right? So we have our gross scheduled rents right here, our vacancy allowance. What did we say was a reasonable number to use for vacancy? 5%. 5%? So should we say negative 5,000 bucks? Close enough? Uh, there's some garages in this building. There's like three garages. You can probably get 100 bucks a garage. So that's $3,600 a year. There's our effective gross income. And then expenses, did, did we say like what a normal typical expense ratio might be on a property in this area? Do you remember? 35%, yeah. So we could just do times negative 0.35, oops, 
we could do equals negative 0.35 times the effective gross income. There's our expenses. Look at that. We got our NOI. I bet people in the back of the room cannot see this. Better? Sorry. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have our NOI, right? Our NOI is 68915 on this property before we apply any debt. <clears throat> now, how about those loan terms? So these days, the loans are not that nearly as good. We think interest rate probably around six. Commercial, it's actually gotten a little bit better in the last couple of weeks. I think you can probably get like 5.65 right now, 30 year amortization. And we, this property is listed for 1.5 million. We want to figure out, now we know our cap rate is at 4.6. We know our gross rent multiplier is at 14. And the reason it's different from what I had on the board is I had this, I had this garage income in here, right? <clears throat> We need to figure out our debt coverage ratio though, to see if we can finance this building with how much down. So to do that, we gotta like throw some proposed financing terms out there. So how much down should we try and put on this building? 20%. 20% uh, would be great. Commercial real estate, they don't let you do 20. 25 is the minimum. So we could try 25, let's see. So 375, there's 370, did I do this wrong? Oh, that's the loan amount, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so that's with 375 down. So that's 25% down, loan amount of 1125. Is this deal possible? Yeah, I have an error here. Yeah. Will the bank do this deal? No. Why will the bank not do this deal? Yes. But he shares the role of point two. DCR is below 1.2. We have a 0.88 DCR. So remember the math here? NOI divided by debt service has to be greater than or equal to 1.2 for the bank to make the loan because they want you to cash flow on your property. So you cannot buy this property with 25% down because there's not enough income at that interest rate to service the debt to 75% leverage. So we can do a few different things to solve that problem. What are, what are some potential solutions to bring that debt coverage ratio up to a 1.2 and make the deal work? Yeah. Increase the down payment. So let's see how that works. <clears throat> there we go. $800,000 loan, 1.24 debt coverage ratio. With $700,000 down, you too could own this building, almost 50% down. And unfortunately, this is pretty much the metrics that we're looking at in the market right now in this area. That's what the debt market has done to us over the last year, is caused this to happen to the whole market. And we're in a really weird situation right now because sellers, myself, are we trying to sell this building, I'm still stuck on this number because this number is what I saw last year. That's what I'm sure it's worth. And uh, I'm not gonna take less, right? So you can put 45% down and buy this building if you want, or you can not buy it, I don't care. Because I have a 2.75% loan on this property. So why would I sell if you're not gonna give me my number? So that is exactly what's going on in the market right now. That's what's going on with homes. That's what's going on with apartments. 
is you have owners, potential sellers with really good financing, numbers stuck in their head, not willing to negotiate and not needing to negotiate. And you have buyers looking at interest rates like this thinking, I'm not paying a million and a half dollars for that building. I want to pay less. So I'll offer less. And then no deal. Right? So that's what's happening all over the market right now. It remains to be seen who will win. Right? In order for anything to really change on the seller side, there'd have to be distress. You'd have to have reasons for the sellers to want to sell, like getting in trouble with the loans or tenants not paying the rent or not being able to collect what you were collecting before, you know, or the buyers would have to be willing to come up with more and, and, and buy. Maybe interest rates go down. I don't know. So, okay, we could put more down. Uh, what else could we do? We go back to the 75%. We could wait for interest rates to go back to three and a half. Even at three and a half, not quite there, right? So even three and a quarter, nope, 3%. Nope, 2.75. There we go. So if rates were to go back to 2.75, you could buy this property with 25% down. That's actually the financing structure I have in this property right now. Yes. Absolutely. It's and it's very significant. You could totally raise the rent prices, and that's a really good point. And you're doing you're adding value at the same time because you have your GRM here, right? So Let's go back to 5.65. What happens if you were to like buy this building with short-term financing and then you've done the math and you know that you can get 1750 for all those units, not 1500. How does that change? Great point. And this is what a lot of investors are doing. Times six, times 12, 126,000. So if we can get the gross scheduled rents to 126,000, that brings it down to 11.9 times gross or a 5.4 cap, much more attractive, right? Better metrics for you as an investor. And you're getting closer on the debt coverage ratio. <clears throat> Let's see, what, what's the delta? No. So yeah, you, you made up about 175 grand, or no, 200,000, right? We, we qualified it with an $800,000 loan before. And now by increasing rents to 1750, it qualifies for a million dollar loan. So that's a very sensitive metric and super effective way to qualify for more debt. And in practice, this is what a lot of people do when you buy properties. This is what I did when I bought this property. I bought it for $900,000. And there are special loans you can use that ignore the debt coverage ratio. They're very expensive and they're short term. Um, they're called bridge loans in our space. You call them hard money loans in a single family. But a bridge loan probably costs you around 10 to 11% interest only. It's probably due. There's a balloon payment in 18 months. The whole loan balance is due. But they'll probably lend you 75% on this deal. And during that time, you could renovate the units, improve the property, and raise rents to 1750 and pay off your million dollar bridge loan with a refinance after it's done. That's called a value add deal. That's what lots of people are doing right now, super popular. And in doing so at the same time, you've added a bunch of value. So I'm not gonna do the comps here because you know we'll run out of time. But remember we did the math here on the GRM at 14 where I had it listed. Let's say the market GRM in that area is 14. That's what properties trade for. If now we're at $126,000 in gross rents, times 14, now we know what our new value is. Now the building's worth 1.76. So you remember when I said, I think today this building's worth 1.8 or 1.7? That's because my rents look more than that, more like that right now. When I put this example together, the rents were 14.92, they're all about 1,700 now. So your question was perfect. Um, the market GRM in that area is about 14. I put that on the loan amount. I apologize. <clears throat> there, look at that. So because you raised the income, your gross rent multiplier is 14. You've now added $260,000 in value by increasing the income. And it probably didn't cost you $260,000 to add that value. You know, a couple upgrades in the units, paint job, 
landscaping. Call it a day. Very popular strategy to buy properties and turn them around like this. Because if you can pay 14 for it at a lower rent and you can raise the rent and it's still worth 14 times gross, that delta is all yours. It's a great strategy. Does that make sense? Everybody? And now if you pay 1.5 for it, so the property might be worth 176, but if you pay 1.5, effectively the property is now operating at 12 times gross for you or a 5.4% cap rate for you, which is much better than you would be able to buy something on the open market in a nice area five blocks to the beach like that. So it's a fantastic strategy. So we've kind of answered everything here. And we can see whether we would buy this versus the surrounding area. So I think that's what I had in our approaches to value. So what we were just doing there is what's called the income approach to value. So all these metrics are useful for valuing investment properties. If you don't understand value, you can't understand how to make money because you ideally want to buy property at a below market value or at a fair market value based on the income that it's producing now. And you want to sell after adding value or after experiencing appreciation, right? So if we understand that most commercial real estate, the value is controlled by the income. If we can control the income, we can control the value. So that was the little example that we just did right there. And this is the way appraisers actually do treat it on commercial real estate. So five unit up apartment buildings, retail, office, industrial, all of that stuff, the values derived from the NOI. So the appraiser gets the NOI, they do the comps in the area, they say the going cap rate in the area is a 4.3 or 14 times gross, here's your value. And that's the value you get on a refi or a sale. <laughs> and that's how you can make a lot of money turning these buildings around and growing a portfolio over time. You also have the sales comparison approach. This is more common in one to four unit properties. The lenders dictate that this is how appraisers have to appraise value in the smaller buildings. And so what they do is they compare different properties based on their location, condition, and size. That usually boils down to what we call price per square foot analysis. So like if you look at a single family deal, you're usually talking about price per square foot. It's the same thing with two to four unit, like small multifamily buildings where a lot of people get started. They'll look at price per square foot, which is kind of unfair, I think, on two to four unit buildings, because as an investor, I'd like to be able to buy a four unit building and control the value by controlling the income. Because really, at the end of the day, investors want to buy it for the income, but the appraiser is going to come in and sometimes you win and sometimes you don't, depending on the size of your building. It can be frustrating. <clears throat> and then you have the cost approach. So uh, for harder to appraise properties where there's not good comps, Appraisers will estimate the cost to replace the building and buy the land, and then they'll apply depreciation based on how old the building is. You don't see that as much uh, in apartment buildings and the stuff that we have here because there's lots of good comps. Generally, a good appraiser, a good appraisal will reference all three of these approaches to value, but in reality, uh, on five and up commercial properties, they're really just mostly using the income approach, and on one to four residential properties, they're using the sales comparison. All right, so uh, to a deeper conversation about cap rates now. So we, we've been talking about cap rates. We've looked at the metrics. I touched, I touched on this for a little bit, but you really have to understand cap rates if you're going to understand investment real estate at all. So you hear this all the time if you're listening to podcasts or you're going to these seminars, and a lot of people misunderstand cap rates. They understand the math. It's just that NOI, right, by value or price. But they just think, well, the higher the cap rate, the better. Because the higher cap rate means I'm going to have higher cash flow. So I'm just going to go try and find the highest cap rate I can possibly find. What cap rates really do is they're a, mar they're a market metric. And they tell you what investors in that market for that asset class are willing to accept for a yield on their invested capital. So we touched on this before, the idea like a bond yield. A higher cap rate actually means more risk. Same thing like a junk bond has super high yield, super high cap rate equals more risk like a junk bond, right? And so if you're like deliberately going out and find the, finding the highest cap rate you could possibly find on LoopNet, 
you are deliberately going out and buying the riskiest property you can possibly find on the internet. That being said, a higher cap rate relative to similar buildings is good, right? You're getting a better deal if you're if you're getting a higher cap rate than all the other buildings on the same block that sold in the last year. You're just getting a good deal, and that's fine, and you should do that. But like deliberately going out and finding the highest cap rate area you can buy in is deliberately going out and taking on as much risk as you can possibly find. <laughs> so you notice things like if you've ever searched around in like the um, if you've ever poked around on LoopNet, things for sale, things like cannabis businesses, warehouses, dispensaries that are federally illegal, like super high risk on those properties, right? The cap rates are like above 10 because your property could be seized at any point by the federal government. <laughs> and so that you got to be compensated for that risk in the form of super high returns. But you're not able to finance those buildings, banks won't touch it, your tenant can't bank, and so on. Yes. No, earlier you said generally that the better areas have a higher cap rate. So lower. Like lower. Right. Rate. Well, because of that risk level, right? Correct. Lower cap rates, better areas. So that that's really kind of the, this is the fundamental bit about cap rates. They're, they're a measure of risk return trade-off. Higher return, higher risk. Higher yield, higher risk. Lower yield, lower risk, more appreciation. Higher yield, higher risk, lower appreciation. Same idea of like growth versus income investing in stocks. And like we've kind of done already in the examples, if we know the property's NOI and we know the market cap rate in that area, we can divide the NOI uh, by cap rate and we get the value. Here's what I'll pay. It's this really powerful ability to have. You don't need a price. You don't need a listing. You don't need a property that's publicly for sale. All we need, we did this math already on my building. All we need is a rent roll multiplied by 12 times 0.65 to account for expenses, divide by the market cap rate. I'll pay a million and a half dollars for it. That's simple. So to your question, here is, it's hard to read, I know. Um, you can go to our website if you want to check this out. It's on our market research dashboard in buckinghaminvestments.com. And you can play with this. And this is kind of fun. This is our actual research that we do at our company in the local market for these cities. And so these metrics you can see. So um, this is for, I think, last year. This looks like last year's numbers. Uh, might be 2021 numbers. Um, we had a ton of sales in Long Beach. After that, San Pedro. So this is the value. This is not just our, us, this is the whole market. And then we go through and we correct all the errors in these and calculate what we think the cap rate would have been and the GRM. So to answer your question, this is a really interesting example. So here's the GRM. So the highest GRM in the whole, all of all these cities from Inglewood down through Long Beach is Manhattan Beach. The, the GRM in Manhattan Beach over this time period was 29. So investors were willing to pay $29.12 for every dollar of rent revenue in Manhattan Beach. And where's the lowest one? Harbor City. It's usually either Harbor City or Wilmington. Yeah, so Harbor City investors were willing to pay $15.27 for the same dollar of rent revenue. So a building generating the same income in Harbor City is worth half what it is in Manhattan Beach. And so you can use research and metrics like this and here's the cap, the corresponding cap rates for each of these cities to extrapolate what a property might be worth if you're looking at it or you're talking to a seller or you're evaluating your own building or you're deciding what it's going to be worth after you raise rents to 1750 or whatever, right? You could say, okay, it's at 1750 Long Beach, 17 times gross, that's what it's worth. Now, this, these numbers include like duplexes and small properties, which generally are more expensive. And so if you're on our website, you can actually filter for like two to four or five and up or just two, two units and so on and different time frames. Uh, five unit and up properties sell for higher cap rates and lower GRM. You get a better deal on those properties. So if we were really comping this, we would eliminate, we would drill down just into that area and see what it looks like. <clears throat> we can do that if you want. And, uh, and it shows you price per unit too and then price per square foot. So sure enough, 
Manhattan Beach, 2.37% cap rate, super low cap rate, right? You basically can't use any debt there at all to buy it. Price per unit, 1.2 million. Price per square foot, $1,300 per square foot average in Manhattan Beach. Pretty crazy. Let's see what else it has. And then the question is, do we buy? And at what price? So let's try it. As long as we're here, why not, right? <clears throat> so if you want to play with this and you're interested, go to plan research on our website. Give it a while to load. And then let's just figure out our exact subject, Long Beach. <clears throat> and I'm going to uncheck two, three, and four units. And we're just going to look at the last year. And the average year was 15.6 across the board. But if we come down here and expand it, here's the different neighborhoods. So this is just free on our site, by the way. You can play with this if you're looking at deals. We spent a lot of time doing this research. It's pretty high quality, if I may say so myself. Um, this property is located in Alamitos Beach, downtown Alamitos Beach, our subject. So. Here's our comps. So last year, there were 28 five unit and up apartment building sales in this area, which is where this property is located. The average GRM was 15, the average cap rate was 4.3. Coincidence? I think that, right? So then the question is, you know, do we buy? So coming back to our little Matrix, let's fix it. Because it was only a one, I was lazy about the rent. <clears throat> so at 14 times gross, 800 grand, loan amount, good deal. 14 times gross, where the market was at 15, we saw. Yes. It's one multiple cheaper than the average of the market. The average of the market is 15 times gross and you're paying 14. It's a good deal. Cap rate looks like a 4.6, a little bit higher than the average of that 4.3 that we saw across uh, here. It's a good deal. We should buy it. If we have you know, $700,000 to pay tax. So to preview, I know we've been getting some questions in the chat about like expenses and how to get into the detail level analysis. So the worksheet that I did was like a super simple version of this. In reality, when we do this for real, we use this spreadsheet. Um, <clears throat> I wrote this, this was actually originally a LMU class project that has gone through 10 years of edits, um, but all you do is you enter in the same information. It looks more complicated, but it's really not. Same building. Here we are, 1.5 million, 3,500 square feet, 1953 construction. When I put this together, interest rates were at three and a quarter. So you could have bought it with 400 grand down and a loan amount of 1.1. This is where rents were. This was the actual rent roll. Here's what I was saying I think you could get. Now it's much higher. So that's been good. Rates have gone up, but so it rents. And then I've got expense assumptions and escalators in here. There's a little bit of upside to income. And then what this does is after you enter in all your inputs, now that we're familiar with all these numbers, it spits out the results. So here we are, 14 times gross, 426 a foot. But look at this. I have two GRM numbers and two cap rate numbers. And the reason is because is there's some upside in rents. So like we were talking about before, you can do the math two ways. You can say, what's my actual GRM, my actual cap rate? 
on the in-place income, or we call it the actual income, or what's the GRM and the cap rate on market rents or market income. So this is your upside, your ability to improve the property after you buy it to the question earlier, right? So I can, I can buy at 14 and improve the property to like a 12.6 multiple, which is way better than you could buy anywhere else. And I can buy the property at a 4.6 cap and get it to a 5.2, which is also excellent, especially for a good location like that. So this is a pretty enticing deal. Um, and this calculates all your expenses too. So I, I saw some questions in there about all this. So we have this, this version of the spreadsheet, I think I used my actual expenses from the previous year when I put this together. So this would have been my 2021 expenses for my property manager's account. In the best of circumstances, you would have P&Ls for two years plus the year to date when you're doing due diligence and buying any property. So that's what I did here. And we know what the actual expenses were. So sure enough, in that year, expenses were 36% of income, very close to what I was saying. You can use as kind of a baseline estimator for that kind of stuff. Um, and this is, you know, another example of just how simple owning apartments are. Like this is it. That was everything. You know, very easy. This includes paying for a professional property manager, so I don't have to go collect rents or anything. I don't have to dispatch repairs. I don't know these tenants. These tenants don't know me. Should keep it that way. Uh, <laughs> and then it, it spits out all of the, the little income statement that we put together before. Go schedule rents, vacancy, parking, other expenses, NOI, annual debt service. And sure enough, so NOI divided by price equals this. And then it's got two columns, right? So you have current and pro forma. So pro forma would be with the market rents in place. Now, I think, you know, today, this has been a while since I updated this. Realistically, it looks more like this. So look how much better that is. Like now, 6% cap rate or 11.3 times gross on at 1750 for rents there. So just because I've owned this property for a long time, I'm taking advantage of the change in, in the rental market during that time. And if I go back and plug 900,000, watch how ridiculous this gets if you want to see just owning stuff over time. Here's what I bought it for. It's operating at eight and a half times gross or 11 cap rate on markets compared to what I paid for. That's just the effect of time doing its thing. So that's kind of what we use to analyze deals. And then this estimates those four elements of return too. So here we are to bring it all together, appreciation, cash flow, tax benefits, equity building, 32%. Good. Yes. We have a quick uh, question from online. Uh, what type of utilities do tenants pay and what type of utilities do owners and managers pay? On the utility question, um, most buildings are separately metered for electricity and gas, which means the tenants pay for electricity and gas, and they have their own meter that they pay based on usage, and they establish an account with the utility company. And the landlord typically pays for water, sewer, and trash, because there's one bill for the property for that. Some properties you see separately metered for trash, some new construction you see separately metered for water too. And sometimes you will have um, systems that are put into place by the management company called RUBS, which is like a residential utility billback system, I think is what it stands for, where they take the square footage of each unit, they prorate the utilities, and then they charge the tenants for the common area stuff. But typically, tenants pay for electricity and gas and the landlord pays for it. So th this is a very complicated model that I don't expect like to get all the way. Obviously, here's you know going into great detail, right? Um, but this is what we use in, in real life to do it. <clears throat> so our answer on this property is, yeah, it's a good deal. Now that greedy owner is definitely not going to sell that building at one and a half million dollars anymore, but it would be a good deal if it were available at that price. <clears throat> so okay, we've decided to buy the property. We like it, one and a half, it checks out, uh, looks good versus the comps. We write an offer, we're ready to roll. So let's talk about the escrow process, due diligence, 
and contract contingencies actually making it happen. Um, so buying a piece of property again is not as simple as you know clicking a button online for the most part. You have to talk to your agents and you write an offer together that's a contract. It's 20 pages long. It's got a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo in there and legalese and contract contingencies and stuff you have to do as a buyer and it's very overwhelming and complicated. Uh, but basically it looks something like this. So uh, you write an offer, maybe they counter, you go back and forth, you agree on the terms. Once the offer is signed by all the parties or the contract is signed by all the parties, that becomes the contract. So offer, mm -hmm. counter, 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 everybody signs, that's your contract. Contract goes over to an escrow company, at least here locally, that's how we do it. In other parts of the country, it's different. Sometimes you use title companies to do this. Sometimes attorney's offices handle this in different states. It's different in every region. But in Southern California, we use escrow companies typically for these types of deals. Um, and they open escrow, which means they take the contract in and they take the buyer's earnest money deposit. That's typically 3% of the purchase price. The buyer is expected to put that up as basically a good faith deposit saying, hey, I'm good for it. Here's a... Uh, $45,000 for a $1.5 million property. This will stay with escrow and that will count towards my down payment when the, when the um, transaction is ready to close and let's roll. Um, they then draw up escrow instructions and the escrow company basically uses the contract to do that. Both parties sign the escrow instructions, seller and buyer. that basically says what their responsibilities are and what the escrow company is gonna do in order to consummate the sale and make it go through. And then you start doing due diligence. So due diligence is probably the busiest part of any transaction. You're gathering all of these books and records about the property. So during this time period for um, a building like this, it would probably be about 17 days, maybe 30 days. And the seller would give you the leases, all the notices of increase, profit and loss statements from the last two years plus year to date, uh, the rent roll, copies of utility bills, any recent work or repairs, upgrades, insurance policies, permits, everything that they have on the property, they need to deliver to the buyer. The buyer then reviews all that stuff and goes back with any questions, right? So what we were messing around with before was just like an Excel pro forma. So we don't know if that's garbage. And half the time, it's garbage. You get into escrow on a building, you've done your Excel pro forma, it looks great and you get all the due diligence materials and the expense ratio is actually 50%, not 35%. So what do you do there? You can either ask for clarifying pieces of information and establish whether expenses were unusually high in the past because they were renovating the property and you expect them to be lower in the future, so you're okay with that. Or maybe these are ongoing expenses and the building actually just operates at a 50% expense ratio because it's got an elevator and a pest control problem and the decks keep getting filled with water and it's just a more expensive building to operate at which point you can renegotiate the deal. And you can say, I was gonna pay a 4.3% cap rate for this property, but at a 50% expense ratio, I'm gonna to have to reduce my price to whatever, 1.3, right? During all that time, you're also engaging your lender and you're giving them the same due diligence information. The lender is actually doing the same underwriting that we were on that spreadsheet. Theirs is even more detailed than ours. And the lender is doing that underwriting to establish what their NOI is gonna be. Because they're not gonna listen to you, they're not gonna listen to the seller. They will use whatever is provided to them from the seller and they'll underwrite to make sure that they think that's, that's legitimate material. And they're gonna come up with what they think the debt coverage ratio is on this deal, not what you tell them. They're gonna do that in conjunction with the appraiser. And you're probably gonna go do your inspections during that time as well. Uh, so you're going to look at the property, you're going to hire a professional inspector, you're going to look at the major four systems, five systems outside of California, but HVAC we pretty much don't have here. So you do roof, foundation, plumbing, and electrical. Um, see if there's any major problems with those systems. That's another opportunity to renegotiate. I had a lot of rain recently. If we discover a whole bunch of leaks, the roof is shot, it's 20 years old. Probably going to ask for 20 grand for a roof or something, right? Same thing with plumbing, foundation, a lot of issues on some of these older buildings. Older buildings are super common in our area. A lot of 100-year-old properties around here. Uh, like I said, you could do some additional negotiations, but the seller doesn't have to say yes. So you could be in contract for a million and a half, and you could say, well, the building needs a new roof, and uh, the expenses were higher than I was expecting. I want a $20,000 credit, and I need a reduction to $1.4 million. 
the seller could say no. If the seller says no, you have your contingencies in place. So your main contingency is your investigation contingency. That allows you to cancel the deal for any reason due to whatever you might find during the due diligence process. So after you do your inspections, you review your books and records and all this kind of stuff, and you make your ask and they're not willing to come down to what you want, you could say, I'm sorry, seller, um, this deal's just not gonna work out for me. I'm gonna cancel. You submit your cancellation paperwork to the escrow company. You get your $45,000 earnest money deposit refunded to you because the contract allows you to exercise your contingencies and do that. And you live to fight another day, go find something else. More typically, you'll probably negotiate, you'll come to some middle ground and you know somebody will kick in 10 grand for the roof and you'll make it work, right? Uh, after you're satisfied with all of your investigations um, and you're also sure you can get your loan, the appraisal's done, value looks good, you sign off waiving all of your contingencies. And when you waive your contingencies, that means that 45 grand is now non-refundable. It's staying at escrow. If you walk away from the deal or you're unable to close for some other reason, it goes to the seller. You lose that money. Uh, but usually you're not going to waive contingencies until you know you're willing and able to close anyway. You prepare to close. You get insurance bound, sign your loan documents, you wire your down payment funds into escrow, and they fund your loan, and then you're done. Deed records, escrow uh, closes, they send you your final closing statement. Congratulations. Here's your keys, your problem. That's how you buy a piece of property. And it pretty much works that way for every type of property with various regional exceptions. So it's kind of a long process. This typically takes about 60 days for a property of this size. That's gonna take about 30 days for a house or a two to four unit smaller property because the loans are faster, but on commercial, it's gonna be 60 days. Questions on that? Not too complicated. <clears throat> and here's a just kind of a sample list of due diligence items that you might ask for in a transaction to verify all these assumptions that you were using in your models. So you might not be able to read this, but this would include leases, Tenant notices, rent roll, profit and loss statements, income statements, cash flow analysis, um, <clears throat> utilities, insurance, uh, property taxes, business license, vendor service agreements, permits, capital improvements, all that kind of stuff. And so you have three main contingencies. We touched on this already. You have your investigation contingency, appraisal contingency, and loan contingency. You can use any of these three to cancel the contract and get your deposit back. The investigation contingency is kind of the biggest one. That's your catch-all deal. And it says, if you find anything you don't like about the property during that time period, you can cancel the deal, walk, and get your deposit back. No problem. So you can even come in and say, I don't like the color of the carpet. I'm out. No problem. You don't even need a reason. You can cancel during that time period for no reason. So there really is like no risk to getting on something. The appraisal contingency, so if you have it, and sometimes that gets negotiated out, but these days you can probably get one. Um, it says if the building doesn't appraise at the contract price, you can cancel. Which also means if the building doesn't appraise at the contract price, you can renegotiate down to the appraised price. But the seller doesn't have to say yes, right? They can say no, you can either bring in the extra down payment or walk. And then the loan contingency says if you can't get approved for the loan that you put in the contract, you can also cancel the lot because you want to be able to get approved for the loan or you won't be able to close at all, probably, right? So those are your three main buyer protections that you have in any deal. Questions on those? Yes. What's your agent looking for you? So your agent is helping you with all of this stuff. Uh, this is all really overwhelming. Your agent. your agent should be the quarterback for getting through all of the due diligence, all of the contingencies, keeping you on track with regard to your timeframes, um, recommending what inspections you might want to consider for the buildings, helping you review the books and the records, matching it up to the pro forma that you had when you did it, um, you know, it, introducing you to lenders, making sure that that process is going as it should be, making sure you have access to all of the units, that you're not forgetting anything, reviewing all the seller disclosures that come over to you and all that kind of stuff. A good agent should help you with all that stuff. That doesn't mean that they always do. A lot of people go buy apartment buildings with agents that have never sold an apartment before, and they don't know the first thing about any of this stuff, and you're on your own. <laughs> so be careful as you're doing that. Uh, but a good agent should, should be on this for you. At the same time, you have to be very careful with that, because at the end of the day, it's buyer beware. 
especially in the five and up unit space. In bigger, with bigger buildings, the laws, they're all designed to protect the buyer, especially for one to four unit purchases, because those are residential loans. Five unit up, it's kind of up to you in the courts to sue the seller if you don't like something. So at the end of the day, no matter what you're buying, it's your duty to do your own due diligence and satisfy yourself with regard to the properties, everything, condition, income, value. I mean, you, know, you have to consider that agents want to make money. They want to make the sale. There's good agents and there's bad agents. The good ones will tell you to walk from a deal when you should walk from a deal. The bad ones will not. And you have to recognize that yourself. Most of them are good. <clears throat> Other questions on contingencies? No. Okay, so that's what I have for the presentation. Uh, here's some additional reading materials if you would like and you're interested in it. Most of this stuff is available on our website for free. If you want to download it, it's not uh, sales material. It's actually a recap of what we talked about today. Um, and I know this is super confusing, detailed stuff. So I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions if we want to do examples and stuff like that too. So let me have it. Before we get into that, the QR code. So scan this, answer your questions. Perhaps I can be of some assistance after you take a stab at it. Uh, so we have a, uh, a Zoom question online. Uh, are there any other books that you would recommend to familiarize ourselves with real estate? Um, yeah, there's a lot of good books. Um, the best really large one is this one here, The Unofficial Guide. One of our founders, Marty, wrote this. Um, you can, it's out of print, but you can still buy it on the secondary market on Amazon. Um, <clears throat> that's a very good one. And uh, I'll go back to the QR code. There's a couple others too that I'm trying to remember. Um, there's a, if you want to get like really, really detailed, the textbook they use in Dr. San's class is really good. Um, I forgot the name of it, it's a super dry name. <laughs> it's like investment analysis for real estate decisions. Wow, That's, that was worth the word. Bang. 12 years ago, I still stuck in my head. That's an excellent book. As far as super, super, like everything pro level, that's the book. Unfortunately, the industry is full of people that want to sell you education and super secret systems. Late night infomercial crowd. Don't buy any of that crap. Um, <clears throat> it's a waste of money. But there's lots of good information and good books out there, just like this. That's a very, very good book. If you want to learn a ton about, uh, the technical stuff in real estate, there's an institution called the CCIM uh, that I highly recommend. In addition to the LMU coursework here, obviously the real estate certificate is fantastic. The courses we have here are great. Um, the CCIM Institute, though, I can bring it up on my computer in a minute after we answer these questions, is probably the most respected professional designation in the business. And they have classes and books that get way into detail, way more detail about the stuff that I was just going on here, uh, going over here today at a level that you won't find in the, um, you know, weekend seminar crowd. So I recommend that. <clears throat> Everyone ready to uh, take a shot at these uh, questions? How do you calculate cap rate? We've got the answer. And then I have a price. It's right there. Mm -hmm. What's a debt coverage ratio used for? Say a louder. To qualify the loan amount? 
Perfect. Gives you the loan amount. Yep. Commercial loan underwriting. What is the income approach to value? Yes. It used to be like market value based on like the. Exactly. It's used to establish the market value based on a building's income. Very nice. Everybody got it? Of the income approach? The, the income approach is a method of valuation used to establish the market value of a property based on its income. Oh yeah, and you get some, uh, you have to scan this too. But I forgot what the deal is with this. You're not allowed to graduate if you don't have like a couple thousand points. Oh, you need some points. Yeah. Okay. So don't forget your points here. Yeah, uh, I can send them out if you want. If you want to yeah. send it to me, I can. Okay. Yeah, sure. We'll I'll send it to everybody. We'll get it out to everybody. And the um, <clears throat> the slides as well. Uh, they are really great. Yeah, there's a lot of good book recommendations here too. Other questions regarding all this stuff? If you want to send it here, sure. Uh, yes, in the back. I have a question about like um, bad loans or like what developers can do when they realize that they can't get off the loan and that's the best way to get that deal. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So, on bad loans and what developers can do or, or people can do if you realize you got to do a bad deal. So the most obvious solution is to sell. <clears throat> if you could sell for more than the loan is worth, it's an equity sale. You get some money out of the deal, back out, you pay off the loan, you go on your way, <laughs> and try again later. Thanks for playing. Um, typically, if you're a developer, you've probably raised funds from investors, which is where things can get dicey. When you take other people's money, you create a security and then you use it and get a loan against that and go buy property. So you're probably gonna try and return your investor capital worth first. And then whatever's left over would go back to you. So if there's equity, you would definitely wanna sell. Uh, another potential option would be to, it, it kind of depends on where you are in the project. This is like very common. This happened a lot in like 2008, 2009 where deals went bad, properties went underwater. And I mean, at some point it gets so bad that you have to walk away and you get foreclosed on, bank takes the property, they resell it to the highest bidder at a trustee's sale and you have a foreclosure on your record. That's worst case scenario and you don't want that to happen. If you have a deal that still potentially has legs and 
it could work, but you just like say ran out of money, or maybe the loan terms weren't as good as you thought they were going to be, or I don't know, an investor pulled out, or the project ended up costing you more than you thought. You can always go raise more capital. Um, so you can go raise additional equity to get the job done. You can go raise more debt to get a second loan, or you could pay off the first loan to do it that way. Or you could JV with somebody, do a joint venture with somebody else that wants to come in and rescue the deal, take your plans, finish the project. Maybe you get a diminished return on what you put in originally. There's a lot of like flexibility for getting out of these things, uh, but it's all about you know what value is left there and what's going to be left when the project is finished and what you think where you think it's going to land. So where things are right now is kind of limbo. A lot of people are wondering what's going to happen over the next three years or so. Uh, for some deals that went in highly leveraged and people are questioning where the exit price might be and construction costs got, got out of hand, but the debt costs got higher. There's some, there's some big question marks in the industry right now, especially in the office asset class <laughs> because of work from home. So yeah. Great question, but the answer is it, it depends. And there's lots of options. Other questions? Yes. You see a lot of people coming together as a group to do these type of deals, and how does that work? Yeah. So the question was, do I see a lot of people come together to, as a group to do these types of deals, and how does that work? The answer is yes. That's super common. So and there's lots of different ways to structure that. The simplest way is you get together with some people you know, and you form a partnership. Typically, people will form an LLC, and they'll each own membership interests in the LLC on a pro-rata basis of their capital contribution, and they'll go buy a property. So we get people that come into our office all the time that want to do that. Uh, there's an inspection going on right now for two friends that partnered up, and they're buying a four-unit or three-unit, and they put their money together, and they're going to put an LLC, buy a property, and split it. Um, at a more complicated level, which is very popular, but much harder to do are is something called syndications. When you syndicate a deal, you general you have a general partner or what's also known as a sponsor goes out and finds a deal and uses their expertise to get the deal in contract, estimate how it might perform, put together a whole pitch deck. And this is what you do in Dr. San's class, I believe. It's when it was taught by Dr. Manning when I took the class, that's what he did. I think he still does the same thing. Um, and then you take your, your deal and you take it out to investors who might want to invest in your deal. And you say, hey, I got this great deal. I'm selling shares, 50,000 bucks a pop. Here's what I'm offering my investors. And generally the sponsor or the general partner, it usually contributes at least 10% of the capital from their own pocket and they raise the rest. But then they take anywhere between 30 to 50% of the profits in exchange for basically running the whole deal. So that's being a syndicator or investing in a syndication is doing that. Limited investors get hold of the deal. They generally will go attend a, you know, a pitch meeting or a webinar where they go over the deal and why we like it, what the returns are expected to be. <clears throat> and if they like it, they subscribe and they send in, they buy however many shares they want to buy, 50,000 bucks, 100,000 bucks. And then they're a limited partner and they are totally passive and they don't have to do anything. They can invest a lower amount and the sponsor, the general partner kind of guarantees the loan, does everything and then issues the distributions to the limited partners after taking their cut. And um, when the property is sold at the end, they get their money back and they get a return. So it's a very common way for developers to raise funds. And that structure is uh, popular across a wide variety of both general partners and limited partners. So like in my corner of the industry, there are a lot of like individuals that bought a few buildings, kind of know how this works. And they'll go raise funds from 15 people and buy a 20 unit apartment. So I, I do that myself too. So for investors that don't want to buy something directly, I syndicate deals. I do a couple a year. I'll take anywhere between like 10 to 20 investors, pull them together. I take some of the profits. We buy a building. They don't have to do anything. Most of my business is brokerage though, where I'll have somebody buy a property directly. 
But at a higher level, like developers will go out and have a development platform where we specialize in building on a high rise apartment buildings in Los Angeles. And it's a $200 million project. And we're raising funds from limited investors that include insurance companies, public pension funds, uh, in the largest cases, sovereign wealth funds, you know, and like, and then those entities and those people are the limited investors and the developers or the operators are the sponsors. So that kind of structure is super common across the whole industry. And that kind of structure is replicated in one way or the other across various vehicles that you can use to invest too. So REITs perform very similarly to that, which is a real estate investment trust. The only difference with the REIT is it's publicly traded and there's some additional regulations on there. But when you buy a share of a REIT, you're doing the same thing, really. The, the, the people managing the REIT are responsible for managing the properties and delivering the returns because of the level of regulations and the public and traded nature of it and stuff like that. The returns get whittled pretty far down if you buy a REIT versus the highest return options generally like buying your own property and doing your own thing or going with a private syndicator, you get a little bit of a higher return, but there's a whole spectrum of what you can get on returns, all kinds of stuff. There's another um, structure called a Delaware Statutory Trust or DST, where people buy into those for cash flow, And those are generally, you'll have a DST sponsor, same deal. And they're buying big kind of institutional assets, you know, stuff like corporate headquarters and giant, campuses and stuff like that, you'll get 6% cash return from that. So it, it's it's a really interesting industry in that like this general kind of understanding how to like structure deals and how capital is applied to real estate and like these basic metrics. It's the, honestly, it's the same for all of that stuff. It's just levels of complexity depending on what you're buying and how the deal is coming together. And that's what makes it so fascinating to me. You can be involved in like, every one of those levels at the same time, or just one of them. And you can do anything with a career in there too. You can be an individual person buying real estate. You can be an individual person raising funds from people to go buy real estate. You can go work for somebody that syndicates or a company that syndicates and work with them on their acquisition side or their asset management side or the debt side. You can place debt, you can place equity, you can work for REITs, you can work, I mean, there's a million things. It's pretty cool. People, I don't think, give enough credit to just how enormous the uh, commercial real estate industry really is when you think about all the different roles that have to be played by people in the company. It's, it's enormous. Other questions? Anything online? We had two more there. Okay. Uh, so, first, in light of its disadvantages, in what scenarios would we want to do a cash out? Um, great question. In what scenario would you want to do a cash out refi? I'm going to show an example. Let's go back to this um, sample deal. Okay. So <clears throat> here's this sample property that we bought again. Um, looking forward. Here's how it might look over 10 years. <clears throat> so at the beginning, if you recall, you're pretty highly leveraged, right? The leverage factor, we le I left it at like three and a quarter percent interest for the example here, but the leverage factor was very high. So at the beginning of the holding period on this particular investment, your return, your combined return is very high, 33%. That's fantastic. But what happens is as you make money each year, your return goes down. So see how the equity is growing in row nine, percentage equity goes from 32 to 36, 41, 45. Your return on equity goes down 33, 30, 27, 24, 22, right? That's because the return on equity is this map. It's this line divided by that line across the board. So as the denominator in that equation grows, the percentage goes down for your return on equity. As the percentage of your return on equity goes down, your ability to execute on that general plan that we talked about at the very beginning of the seminar gets harder. If we're trying to like average a 25% rate of return on our properties over time, 
by the time we're here in year six, if we own this property with the current capital structure any longer than that, we will no longer be averaging 25%, right? Because we started at like 33, and now we're down to like 21. I'm just eyeballing it, right? And so by the time you're here and you're at about 50% equity, if you can if you can read that, you're at about a million fifty in equity in year six in a two million dollar property, you have a problem. You're no longer going to be able to execute on that plan goal that we talked about. And you have to re-leverage. That's when you would want to do a cash out refi. So yeah, you're taking on more debt, but what you're probably going to do there is you're going to keep this property. It's worth two million bucks. Now you can get a million and a half dollar loan on it because you can put 75% debt. Let's just say it's the same numbers, right? Subject to the debt coverage ratio. If I get a million and a half dollar loan on that property, I have $500,000 in my pocket. I can go buy another $2 million property. Now I have two $2 million properties with 500 grand in equity in each. I've re-leveraged my leverage factors back up to four and you can kind of get it in your head, your ROE is now way back up 25, 30%, depending on the deal. So you use cash out refis to re-leverage and re-multiply your return again when you own the property and it's, it's deleveraged for too long. So I actually did this on this building. I bought this building for 900,000. I've now refinanced it twice after my original purchase loan and took more money out to buy more buildings. And so I currently have I think my loan is very similar to what I wrote here. I did a 75% loan and I think it appraised at like 1.55 last year or 2021. And so I'm kind of riding that back down again. And then once it gets back low again, I'm going to refinance it again, go buy another property again. And that's how you add to your portfolio. So I am adding to my debt load. Uh, I am decreasing cash flow when I take on the additional debt. This, this number gets lower when you add more debt to it. But I'm still in the working years of my life, right? I'm in my early 40s, uh, working hard, go to the office every day. I have active income. That's a great time in your life to continue to invest more aggressively to grow your portfolio, right? Depending on what anybody wants to do. I could stop if I wanted to, but whatever. So by the time I'm 50, I want to be in a position where I really can't justify going to the office anymore. <clears throat> and if I want to be there, I need to keep doing this strategy and keep refinancing or exchanging. A 1031 exchange has exactly the same math because the difference is here. If I sold a $2 million building and I got a million out, I could put a million down by a $4 million building. A million dollars in equity in one $4 million building is the same mathematically as 500,000 in equity in two $2 million buildings. It's identical. So that's what I've been doing for the last 13, 14 years with my own portfolio. And I went from a duplex to 22 buildings about 175 units, but I take, I have low cash flow because I have a relatively high debt load. It's still, it's positive. I could live on it if I wanted to. Um, I combined like loan to value across my portfolios at about 65%. Um, but you know, I don't want it to get down to 50 or so because then it's, my money's not working as hard for me as it could be. And so that's why you would do your cash in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Follow-up question. Um, is there a difference between cash out refi and HELOC? Uh, yes. So um, the difference between a cash out refi and a HELOC, well, technically they're both cash out refis because in both situations, it's a, well, HELOC's not a refinance rule, but they're both cash out financing options. So a HELOC is generally a second loan which goes behind your first. So if you have a regular first position mortgage, call it a 30 year fixed, you can get a HELOC that's like a line of credit that you can draw on that's in second position behind that loan. It has the same effect as getting a cash out refi. So, you know, you'd have a million dollar first that's 30 year fixed and go get a $300,000 HELOC. You can draw on a HELOC if you want to upgrade a property or go buy another one. Generally, HELOCs are adjustable rate loans though. So I have a HELOC on my house and the rate was at 3% a year ago and it's at 7% right now. So you have to watch for that with the HELOCs. With a full cash out refinance, usually when you talk about a refinance, you're talking about paying off your existing loan. And so typically when people say cash out refi, they mean refinance the existing balance on the property, pay it off, 
and get a new loan for a higher amount than your original loan, but now you have one loan still covering the whole property. So if you had a million dollar first and you did a cash out refi for 1.3, you would have a new $1.3 million first mortgage that might be a 30 year fixed loan. And you'd be making payments on that versus a million dollar first that stays in place and a $300,000 second key line. In both cases, you have $300,000 cash in your pocket, but the terms of the two notes are different. Right now, HELOCs are way more popular because a lot of people have a first loan on their home at a really low rate that they probably originated in the last two or three years, and they don't want to pay that off. Because if you paid it off, you'd be paying in the 60s. So, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? We got another one. Um, what do you think is the most important thing to take away from this presentation? Uh, good question. Um, I think the most important thing to take away from the seminar is the idea of these interrelated financial concepts, how they affect each other. That's really what I was trying to get at. So it's, it feels like it's all just a bunch of meaningless um, formulas and stuff like that. But when you, this whole example that I did, I really want people to understand how these pieces fit together. That's everything when it comes to analyzing deals and the fundamentals of investing in real estate. If you understand the trade-off between cash flow and appreciation with cap rates and the impact of cap rates on leverage and the impact of leverage on returns and how all those pieces fit together, you've got a really good start. That's, that's the key. It's tricky. It sounds like a lot. It's really not that complicated. This pretty much gave you everything you need to know to make millions of dollars today in three hours. Just got to apply it. Other questions? Yes. I didn't think I had a question. For selling? I mean, typically you're that you're doing brokerage, really, when you're doing that. Uh, people do that in the form of like wholesaling instead, which is still basically the same thing as as brokerage. Um, at the end of the day, they're going to pay what they want to pay based on what they think the land is value at. So if you're just I mean, to, to give you like the broker answer, it's if somebody comes to me with a land listing, I actually have one of them that I'm about to list. And it's a parcel that has plans that are almost approved to build 20 units, a 20 unit apartment. And so I'm thinking about a marketing strategy for that parcel to maximize the price for the seller, right? To make it as appealing as possible to the buyer. We're going to hire an architect to do some renderings of the plans. And then when it hits the market, the potential buyers will see, oh, beautiful renderings of what you could potentially build, helps them have the vision of what they could do with it. You know, yeah. Yeah, sell the dream. Like what, try and illustrate what's possible, what the likely uses of the land would be, what the zoning allows, um, sketches renderings uh, the most valuable thing would be entitled plans you know but that takes years and tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars in architects and permit fees to get them so you know if that's not going to happen then as a, as a marketing concept you're trying to show what you can use that out. questions yes um, Great question. So the question was, as somebody looking to enter the real estate industry, what are some of the hard and soft skills I would recommend you work on in order to be successful? Uh, I mean, the soft skills, real estate's all relationships, right? So at the end of the day, 
there's a buyer and there's a seller and there's everybody in between that all has to work together. And all of those people in one way or the other are making a living off of doing this. And whoever you are and whatever role you are playing in that transaction or in owning that building or in managing that building or in raising funds for that building or in financing that building, you got to get along with everybody and you have to, you got to be better and easier to deal with than the next person, right? So being able to create and maintain relationships is everything. It's all a sales game at the end of the day. Even like I'm actually in sales, but even every other role in the business is also in sales because that's just how it works. It's a highly transactional business. If you're in financing, you're still in sales. Congratulations. You have to go meet people to get loans. If you're syndicating deals and you're going to put together a big fund, you're still in sales. You got to go show up and shake hands and convince people to invest with you. You know, uh, all of these things. So, yeah, I mean, relationships are everything. And to the extent that you can be good meeting people and be friendly and trustworthy, that's everything. There's absolutely no room for unethical behavior in the business. Depending on what corner you find yourself in, you'd be amazed at how small the community a lot of these markets are. Like in my little corner of the market, we all know each other. All the brokers, a lot of the owners, all know each other. And if you do something unethical or dishonest, you're out, you know? So uh, reputation is super important. Uh, being responsive, picking up the freaking phone. If you cannot tell you how many people can't respond to a phone call or an email, that's a great place to start. Uh, as far as hard skills go, all this stuff is great. I mean, finance, accounting, uh, you know, management, this is, this is, but, but this is just a ticket to entry. If you don't know this stuff, you're just not going to be successful. You know, I think you need to know this stuff. Um, but there's a lot of super smart people and there's a lot of money to be made. And there's not a whole lot of, you know, understanding for people that don't, but everybody starts somewhere. So, you know, that's okay. But this, this is just an entry table, you know. It's all about relationships. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> Other questions? Question. Yeah. Do you think the industry is saturated or there's room for more? There's always room for more people. Yeah, I mean, there's these hilarious charts of the number of licensees that you see all the time. And they always show the chart from like 2008 and the number of licensees just goes like this when the economy goes down. That's happening right now. People are exiting the business right now because it's hard. It's a highly cyclical business. The market is tough right now. Transaction volume is down by about a half of what it was last year. And for people that make a living on transactions, which is pretty much everybody, that means there's not as much business to go around. So there's a lot of people leaving the industry entirely. I personally think it's a pretty good time to get in because other people are leaving. That's when I got in. Everybody was running for the exits when I started. Perfect. There's always room for people to do better. There's also a lot of incompetent people in the business that thinks they think it's easy and they go do it because it looks like a real easy paycheck. And it turns out it's not. So that should be wind in your sails if you're actually motivated to do a good job. Because those people are not going to do it. Yes. From like a brokerage standpoint, what relationship, if any, uh, would a brokerage have with real estate developers? A lot. Uh, so the question was what relationship, if any, would a brokerage have with real estate developers? Real estate brokers and real estate developers have to work together. So developers want to buy properties to develop and they need to sell the finished product. And brokers need to be involved in both of those scenarios. There's usually a broker involved in almost every one of those sales. It's not always. Some developers do their own marketing and they'll go after parcels that they want to buy themselves with their own marketing campaigns and deal directly with the owners. But typically brokers spend all day, every day, trying to find deals for people that might want to buy so brokers and developers have to work together every day. 
Um, I have, a, you know, I would say a small circle of developers that I know that are clients of mine that I've worked with before. And we talk all the time. And so like I was telling you about this deal I have coming up, it's a 20 unit permits ready to issue development deal in mid city from one developer who bought it and got it entitled over a couple of years to build. And he doesn't want to build it. He wants to sell it because he's going to make money on the sale. He got the plans approved. All he did was work with architects in the city to get the plans approved. And now the building's worth, the, the property's worth way more than it was because he's got approved plans ready to go. And a developer who actually wants to build a project is going to be super excited because they don't have to go through two years of permit hell to build it. And guess what? I know both of those people. I put them together, make the deal happen, I make my commission, everybody's excited. So absolutely, yeah, you need to know developers. Not every broker, you know, has that specialty. You certainly don't need to. Um, some do, that's, that's a more complicated corner of the business to be sure. You know, development, you really need to know a lot about everything because <laughs> you have to know what the finished product is gonna be worth and what you can sell it for. And you have to be able to know what it's gonna cost to build it, to get it to the finished product which then allows you to value the project to sell. You have to know what their investors are gonna expect out of what they go to raise capital. So there's like this huge ecosystem of people all kind of like, you know, living on the same chain of like one deal. I don't know a better way to, you know, describe it, but um, you really need to know it at every level to do that well. But yeah, there's lots of opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. Cool. One more question. Yes. Um, what is like the one tip or like the one advice you would give on being good at sales? I'm being good at sales. One piece of advice. Uh, wow. It's just about meeting people. It's a, it's about action. I, I think a lot of people focus on the wrong thing. With sales, and they think if you say if, you, if I had just said the right thing, I would have gotten the deal. And I said the wrong. That's not it. You just didn't shake enough hands. That's not it. Sales is it's a numbers game. Yeah, you got to be personable. You got to be good with creating relationships. But if you don't show up, like I have agents that come into my office and they sit at their desk and they watch the video of me doing this presentation ten times in a row. <clears throat> until they feel like, oh, I know it so well, I could deliver this presentation. And I'm going to go out and meet one person and I'm just going to kill. And I'm going to have them for three hours and it's going to be great. And they're going to buy the first property I'm going to show to them. That's not how it works. Whereas the other agent that didn't sit down and watch this video for 10 times in a row went out there and shook a whole bunch of hands and went to networking events every day for a month, got 10 clients out of it. You know, it, sales is about action. It's about meeting people. It's about numbers. Everyone's not going to buy from you. Everyone's not going to like you. And that's okay. But you got to go out and meet people. That's what it is. It's 100% lead generation. What you do after that, you can work on, you can develop that skill, you can get better at it. Experience will do that for you. But if you don't find people, you will not sell anything. You got to go find clients. And that's unfortunately the hard part for them. Other questions? Anything else online? Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it. Hopefully uh, you take the rest of the seminars and get your certificates. Everyone's really great. They're even better than me, I promise. And uh, we'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Before you go, do you mind sending me that? Sure, yeah. Let me get your email right. Hey. Hey. Yeah, for sure.
I also found the uh, the videos you're talking about. Oh, good. Yeah, they're on the uh, the one below ones. No, 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 they're on Alex. Oh, they have their own. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's like an exam. It's kind of good. Like of the oh, would you recommend that like, I give a chat through it? Yeah, I would just blow through it, do the quizzes, and, and then the I tests. actually started studying. Yeah, the, even the tests themselves from the modules. Yeah, have you been a college student any time in the last 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> so let's say like you don't pass. Let's see the maximum amount of time. I, I don't. I think you can just retake it. Like that. Oh really? Yeah. You were the last yeah, session. Yeah. 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 What are your needs? Why are you looking for this? What time are you looking for that kind of yeah. thing? Yeah, that's what I think. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nice, meeting. nice meeting you as well. Okay, okay. good questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks um, for coming. I'm just like interested in the university. And, mm -hmm. like, I remember you saying that like these people are not saying that's like they're like, yeah, people are living. But like, is it like harder to like get into the different side of the station? It is. So yeah. maybe you're like, what would you do differently? It's less competitive at the same time, okay. you know, because people are because so I mean it's a great time to like learn and start and do your first few days mm -hmm. because that's going to be a slow time for you anyway. Uh -huh. Like I have agents that started in 2020 and 2021, which was super aggressive, yeah. busy time to be involved. Yeah. And they're like on the sidelines watching everybody make all this money and they're brand new and they're like, I don't know what to do, you know, and then yeah, nothing happened for that, right? You yeah. know, because they were so yeah. new. So it's a good yeah, job. I'm, I'm just waiting to be fine. Yeah, it yeah. is hard. There are fewer transactions. Yeah. It's harder to make it work. Very, very friendly, very yeah. Friendly. Uh, but what you're right. if you get with a good company and you, you know, put in the work yeah. and you understand, yeah. like, you'll come out of this. And that, that's all right. I started waiting. What you guys Okay. That's like, nobody wants to eat some. Right. Yeah. State state and by the time it was like 2012, 2013, when it was like this, yeah. Yeah, I have years of experience on it. Exactly. You know, and then I was ready to go and my business took off. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something, I don't know, sales is something that excites me. I like meeting people. I like it's fun. And needs. And yeah. that is in sales as well. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's great. Yeah. It's, 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 and this is so much more than it's like, like you, you know, I mean, we do all of this for all our clients. Yeah. You really bring it down. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Then, my yeah. check yeah. is a commission. Right, so you can pay that price, but this is what I do with my clients, which is like so much fun for me. Oh, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah, right. I feel like I would enjoy like the chase, like I enjoy getting the clients and like explaining to them. I don't have the joy, right? Like, right. Like, and it's not like, like okay. you know, the clients want what you have. Um, it's not okay. like you're selling vacuum cleaners, or you know, or kitchen knives or whatever, right? You know, like the people honestly. They're usually talking to you because they want to invest in the So it's not like you're a used car salesman guy. Yeah, you know? true, true. It's <laughs> huge. Um, which area of real estate do you think like, is the most opportunity? Because I know you said the residential, the commercial, which is unowned lands. Like, yeah, you know, I mean, you can make a business of any of that, honestly. Okay. Um, yeah. You have to take great um, question. I, I think the multifamily we always have. Good opportunities. Okay. Because uh, I mean, I there's so much of it everywhere, okay. and everyone needs a place to live. Sure, but that's my advice to people because I'm the money. Okay. And so I, I think it's less cyclical. Is there other parts of the business to find it? So there's multi accounting. That's right. It's called accounting information for um, maybe single family. Yes. Yeah. I, if you if you really want to be like a commercial real estate and you're professional, you're professional, you're professional, you're professional, you're professional you're single family is better. So if you're really you're there are definitely people that make a lot of money doing single so family. Next semester, take so you know, you know, it's TV, you know, some also kind of But it's like you're working nights, you're working weekends, and after that, and it's all this like. It's easy. I wish yeah, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's like how much you, it's all, it's an emotional purchase decision for you. Exactly. Yeah. Which is frustrating. Yeah. Whereas this stuff is all finance and investments. So I, I think any commercial asset class is more interesting than you have to say. Um, 
I'm interested in retail right now. That's good. Um, office has an interesting future, but right now, office is dead. I'm curious to what you think. I don't mean to use job. Can I ask what interests you about retail right now? Um, because I, I think there's going to be, I think there's value to be had there either way, and I think it's also, I think there's a lot of undervalued retail out there. Um, I've bought a couple of retail buildings recently, and myself, and they're doing really well. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to me. Um, and I think there's a nice ability to like buy stuff and reposition it and. There's always going to be a need for it, even though the need may, may not be like going to the store to buy something. E-commerce has kind of destroyed that. Service retail and experiential retail and grocery anchored retail, all that is alive and well and kind of reinventing itself like that. Um, so I kind of like it. It's more complicated for sure. It's really difficult to understand. You know, I, I, it's a hard thing to get into, I think, for your first stuff but it's interesting what are your thoughts on manufacturing plants <laughs> um i mean industrial that that's part of industrial yeah um industrial has gotten super hot over the last few years because of all the e-commerce and the last mile distribution and it's so competitive that there's almost it's it's a weird part of the industry right now Okay. I think it has to adjust back down um, significantly okay. as those companies kind of like retool for what the demand landscape is going to look like moving forward. Um, manufacturing, I don't know specifically about manufacturing. Um, a lot of people like industrial a lot. A lot of investors like industrial because it's really easy. True. It's triple net lease. You just lease somebody a lot or a warehouse. Yeah. They do their thing 10 years. You never hear from them. Okay. A lot of environmental problems. Yeah. With manufacturing, sure. with industrial in general, you've run into a lot of environmental issues, which are a nightmare. Environmental issues are absolutely a mix. So then you would lose a lot of money on to that because of legality. Yeah. Okay. Remediation, cleanup. I mean, you're probably going to know about it because you're going to do a phase one and a phase two environmental uh -huh. um, survey, which is what you do when you buy a commercial property. You do those environmental um, searches. Not every time. I own a building that got we got surprised about an environmental issue. Mm -hmm. Six hundred thousand dollars later. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it can be bad. It can be bad. Um, this was a really great thing. This one. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. I was glad to see you make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you an item when I ask you the group. But like, do you know how to make the comparison between international and American? Yeah, that's what I'm not good at. Okay. Because um, I just don't know. Like, how do we, if how if do somebody we were to bring me, I mean, yes. If somebody were to bring me the rules and the financing structure and the rents and all the, all the pertinent information of an international like one deal, yeah. this is how it looks. I would easily be able to compare that to what we have here. Yeah. But so, I don't, I don't, I'm not well equipped enough to say investing in Paris looks like this versus LA. Yeah. It's a big conversation for a lot of us, like my community, because Abby's in school, and we're from Ethiopia, and mm -hmm. people invest in Abby's, it's hot, it's hot, like for the international market. Uh, and everybody's always making the argument for like the high rents, if you are the international communities pay. But I think when you talk about that, I thought, well, this is the yield versus. The, yeah. ca the right. cash flow argument, right? Because they're looking at the the uh, cash flow. Right. I mean, the what did you call it? I don't know. The, yeah. the rental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, but we don't know how that property uh, like appreciates over that. We really don't. No. Yeah. The main thing with the big thing about U.S. real estate is that our financial system mm -hmm. and our legal system is ridiculously well built out and strong. Right. And I don't know first thing about any other countries, honestly, so yeah. I can't speak intelligently about it. But that's the reason the whole rest of the world right. invests in real estate here is because we have unusually good financial systems. Yeah. So like the loans here have better terms than you can get in any other country I've ever heard of. Yeah. The tax treatment is better here than it is in any other country. 
and safe for two. Because there's a lot of unknowns. There's so, there's way less exactly. It's about uncertainty. So like other countries, uh, the government could just take your property, exactly. or somebody else could just take. Your That's why I feel I feel yeah. uneasy, and I'm like, unless I know all these little details, right? Right? Like right. how will I know other than you gotta like, everything like that in that area? area. Or if somebody, if somebody gives me all those details, then I can comfortably say, right. I can compare those. But you have to find that person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, that's the thing here is like every level of of the real, real estate industry in the United States is secure, insured, regulated. Yeah. You know, like it is very, Yeah. I like to say it's the Wild West sometimes in, in that, you know, you, you can create inefficiencies by investing in different markets. On the other hand, the systems that we have in place here, as far as the legalities and the regulations and the financing, are second. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's very serious. But the people that argue are to invest in, they're not going to say that's a higher uh, entry point here. True. So that's the, the safety true. and like, true. yeah. No, that's actually so true because in Dubai, like, yeah. you know, the state market hasn't appreciated for the last four years. Right. And vis if you look at any city in the US, even Texas is like, they've gone everywhere. Like, yeah. yeah. So high. Yeah. Even where I'm from, I'm from Mumbai in India, and mm -hmm. the real estate market is just yeah. it's actually dipped a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Which is the appreciation is there, but you get a lot of like yeah. Because in my classes, yeah, I just heard about real estate as the best investment, but back home, I'm just like it just. <laughs> so this it's conversation totally just yeah, yeah, just yeah. Made me, uh, it's just totally so what the your buyers are they international? A few, not a lot. Not a lot Most right. people, if they are, they've lived here for many years. And they're kind of you know yeah. part of the U.S. system now. Okay. Um, although I met with some French people um, yesterday. Yeah. So because I would think that like, there's a lot of high net worth people there. Like, they what they do with their income. They come here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Quite a few of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That could be a good business getting like high net worth. I know. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> buying. No, that's actually that's actually a very common strategy for a lot of investors. There's a program called the EB5 program yeah. that they did for years where you could do that. I think they gutted it and they made it harder to do now. Yes. I forgot the details of it. But I know one of my partners that did that for years, bringing investors over from Vietnam. Yeah. And um, there, there's a lot of ways you can do that. And if, if you have an extensive network in another country of people that need to get their money out and into a safe place and you're a trusted advisor who's here, yeah. you can make a killer business out of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I need to make more friends. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's been like a few months back. It's all relationships. Yes. Right? It is. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, we already have each other. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Bye. Take care. Anthony, thank you. Absolutely. I'm emailing you right now before I forget. Beautiful.